percent. Perfect. Okay, ma'am, we are on the record, and I just want to build the record here real fast. Uh, this is Craig Kenworthy. I am in the City County Building in the outer office of Marion County 12 under the uh, presiding judge, Judge David Serto. I'm ordered to be here on the 16th of March, and it's after 1230. Uh, I am with Dr. Calloway, who is a court-appointed psychologist who is supposed to do a mental competency evaluation as required by Marion County Court. And actually, there's a clock in the office here that has it at 12.41 p.m. on the 16th of March. And Dr. Calloway, if you could just do something to acknowledge this. Sure. Dr. Calloway, present in the room. Just okay. the two of us right now. All right. Yeah. And so, great. Um, and, I've, I, and, I, and just for the record, I have requested, and Dr. Calloway has been very uh, accommodating in allowing me to actually have uh, my digital recorder on during this proceeding, so there's no dispute about what was said and what was not said. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, doctor. Sure. And Mr. Kenworthy, how old are you? Uh, I'd like to go back to your initial questions, if you don't mind. First, you had a you sure. set up, and I'd like to respond to that. Um, off the record, before I turned on the tape recorder, Dr. Calloway was kind enough to explain her approach for conducting this interview and how she, the basic areas of my life and the case and so on she wanted to go into. Um, she'll correct me if I mis misstate those back to her. I've also uh, submitted to her the, uh, a sworn statement that I did today to the court, my response to the motion or the state's request for competency evaluation, uh, the sworn statement laying out my uh, uh, asserting of my Fifth and Sixth Amendment rights, my Sixth Amendment right to counsel, and my Fifth Amendment right against not to be compelled uh, to conduct uh, to answer questions in a custodial interview. As Dr. Or, excuse me, as David Serto, Judge David Serto, has stated that if I didn't attend this evaluation today, that I would be jailed. I considered this a compulsory interrogation or, or custodial interview by Judge, or, excuse me, by Dr. Callaway at the command or, or direction of, of uh, Judge David Serto. That being, I believe that my uh, Estelle versus Smith. Smith, thank you very much. Estelle versus Smith was a United States Supreme Court case from the 1980, which the prosecution and the judge cited in their uh, order uh, for today, uh, gives me the right both to uh, not to be compelled to answer questions, number one, number two, uh, to have six minute right to counsel, and uh, number three, uh, to not, uh, it basically warns not to waive those rights or anything you say can be used against you in a proceeding. I have asserted my Fifth Amendment right to counsel, but I'm trying to explain to also Dr. Callaway, uh, based on her structure for doing this uh, interview, uh, what my uh, response is to that. Uh, first thing, ma'am, is this. Um, I'm looking at the state's request for competency evaluation, which was uh, filed by the state of Indiana on the 3rd of uh, March, so I'm sorry, on the 10th of March, 2017. And on the last page in that, on paragraph 9, it states, that a competency hearing is required by Indiana Code 35-36-3-1 when the court has reasonable grounds for believing that the defendant lacks the ability to understand the proceedings and assist in the preparation of a defense. And says the state believes the reasonable grounds exist for the evaluation. This belief is based on all information presented in the above gathered from the various law enforcement sources, his family, community members, and his oral statements during court hearings, which they don't include in that in the competency evaluation, so I have no idea what they're referring to. Uh, instead of me stating that I believe an investigation was due for the, uh, the prosecutor's office in this matter. The state contends that the defendant lacks the ability to comprehend the proceedings and or to competently assist in the preparation of his pro se defense and therefore requests a court order uh, competency evaluation. Now, I, I have to ask you, Dr. Callaway, if you don't mind, have you read 353631? Yes. Okay, I imagine based on what you do, you're very familiar with it. Yes, that is true. Okay, great. And so you understand then, for the, my reading of it, and I used to be with the U.S. Attorney's Office, so mm -hmm. I've gone through criminal statutes a little bit in my time, um, that it has two parts to it. One, do I understand what the elements of the crime are? And two, do I understand what the penalties are for those crimes? That would also be your understanding? Uh, so the competency statute, I mean, there are two basic prongs to it, and the first one is, do you understand the nature and object of the proceedings? So mm -hmm. do you understand the court proceedings? Do you understand your charges and mm -hmm. your current circumstances? Yes, ma'am. Yes, and then that second piece is, are you able to assist in your defense, which is a little different in your case because it sounds like you want to represent yourself. And I'll, I'll explain that in just a second, ma'am. Okay. Uh, yeah, yes, okay, so those are the two problems you understand. Right. And, and, and the third problem would be if I would, would assert a sanity defense, obviously you can do an evaluation on that. Right, and the court, right, and that's yes, a little bit separate issue because one, you have to deal with the competency and if 
you know, court has to make a determination on that, and then you go to if you're going to claim insanity or not. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. And and so um, and so, let's take the the last one first because the court order for today. There's two court orders. Both court orders uh, try to allege a, a possible insanity defense. And I want to state for the record, now and for the future, mm -hmm. there will never ever be an insanity defense okay. offered in these matters. Okay. Nor have I ever right. hinted of one. Well, and I mean, if you represent yourself, that's obviously your choice. But also, if you work with your, if you were to work with an attorney, you two would decide if that would be your defense or not. But if you tell me today I'm not going to use that defense, then we don't need to sort of talk that through or investigate that right now. Yes, ma'am. Um, first I, and foremost, I think the they're concerned about the competency. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Well, well, and they did since they raised the new orders. Right. So Absolutely. That will not happen. Yeah. Uh, okay. Also, just to let you know, ma'am, I have tried to hire legal counsel for this case. Okay. And legal counsel uh, appears to me to be intimidated by the prosecution here in Marion County. I had an individual yesterday that I had uh, handed over money mm -hmm. and was going to take the case, was going to come here today to have a, a conversation with you with everything I'm saying to mm -hmm. you. And then after he talked to the prosecutor, he withdrew from the case and handed me my money back. So, and he's the one that advised me not to answer any questions today. He said there's no way you should ever, would ever answer questions under that, that situation. So, and he was my attorney after I, I had paid him the money and he was my attorney mm -hmm. for that time period. So, uh, and so, and I have, I have sought, and I also sought, because I was, had been cleared out of my funds, I also sought uh, court-appointed legal counsel uh, because I qualified at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, the public defender's office did a couple of things. Number one, they kept... They wouldn't allow me to have the attorney they assigned to me first who wanted to represent me, who I wanted to represent me. They switched out from her, and the one after her then refused to do any discovery for me. She said, no, we don't do discovery in the public defender's office, which you may know as a uh, psychologist is uh, malpractice as an attorney. You don't do discovery to find out what the other side is doing and, and search things out. That's pro se. Uh, that is... Uh, by the numbers, malpractice. And even David Hill said, no, we don't do it, and we're not allowed to do it. And I thought, told him, you shouldn't be the public defender for the Marion County. So that's the reason why I don't have a counsel. If I could find somebody, I had mm -hmm. the money, and if I could find somebody who could represent me and actually do the proper work that I would do for other people, actually, I do represent defendants right now. I do actually file motions. I do actually file for discovery. I actually do file, go to crime scenes. And so just, just to make just, sure I'm yes, clear, so if you could find someone, you absolutely. would be willing to work with Absolutely, them. absolutely. Okay. You know, as, here's the reason why. Uh, an, another attorney that's going to have insights on my case that maybe I don't have. Okay. Uh, my background for limited purpose of discussion is I used to be on the prosecution side with the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Eastern District of North Carolina on loan from the Marine Corps. Gotcha. All right. My highest level case, I third seated a second degree murder case. It could have been a first, it should have been a first degree murder case. And we got a conviction on second degree murder. Uh, and I handled a lot of misdemeanor stuff below that. Okay. So I have on the left side, and I have some defense work that I've done. I'm, and I'm, I'm working pro bono defense cases now. And I do all the, the full spectrum of, of defense work from listening to 911 calls down to visiting scenes and doing the whole thing pro bono, all right, for people who so they don't get what worked over in the system here. Mm -hmm. and, and I go right through a checklist, which the public defender's office doesn't seem to want to do. Gotcha. So a couple things. Yes, ma'am. It sounds like, number one, and most important, you understand why we're meeting today. Yes, ma'am. Um, so it also sounds like you have some reservations about participating well, yes, in the evaluation. Yes. So let's, mm -hmm. let's tackle that first. So like I said before we were on record, um, the main things I'd want to get some of your history and then talk through your understanding of the court, your understanding of your charges. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have to go through the details of sort of your version of things unless you want me to have that information. I just want to ask you questions about you know, making sure you understand what's happening in court, you understand, um, you know, your charges and what could happen, and that if you work with an attorney that you're able to do that, if you go pro se that you're able to do that. So I want to find out, I mean, are you willing to, to sort of walk me through those well, things? Well, well, yeah, and the thing is I'm not willing to discuss any of my history, ma'am. Uh, because it, okay. because it, I mean, history does not go to whether I can understand that you, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm a strict legalist when it comes to, to matters. And the, and the bottom line is we're not going under insanity defense here. Mm -hmm. The two prongs that you've already stated on the record, ma'am, are do I understand the charges against me and do I understand the penalty? Right. All right? And I'm, I'm right now under two misdemeanor, uh, under uh, two different cases 
misdemeanor charges. Okay. The two cases, the first one is I was arrested in, so, oh, so, so, so before yes, we go please. into all that detail, um, let me just tell you why the history is important. For me, it helps me understand how you got to this point um, and things that have happened in your life. Um, you know, I would want to know about mental health treatment, I'd want to know about how long you've worked in a, as an attorney. All those things help me better understand you and how you got to this point and how that could relate to competency. Yes, ma'am, but that's not the statute. That's not the statute. I understand what you want to do, ma'am, but it's not right. the statute. Okay. The statute okay. is, do I understand, and that, like, like I said, you said you've read the statute, you said you're basically an expert on it. The statute is two prongs. Do I mm -hmm. understand the basis of the charges against me? Do I understand what the penalties are? And if I'm wrong, correct, we'll, we'll, we'll pull the copy. Like that one, well... I you know, that's correct. I'm just telling you, from my perspective, they're asking me to find out if you're competent, and that also encompassed within that is if you have any mental health I do not have any mental health issues. On. I do not have any mental health issues well, going right. on. Right. No, I understand that, but I still need to ask questions to and be I, able to. And I will. And I will refuse those answers, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Well, then let's do this. I'll ask you some questions, and then you can you can decline to answer them. On the advice of counsel. Yes. On the, if you want to. On the advice of yeah, counsel. Yeah. Okay, that's your choice. Yeah. The bottom line is this: I have nothing to hide, but I'm not going to wave go away from the statute. And, it's, and, I had, okay. and let's go on the record here since this is, I want to speak slower since we can transcribe this because this will go to appeal. Sure. Um, the bottom line is this, is that I understand the charge of trespassing in a Napolese restaurant at 5 o'clock in the afternoon for a, after I had purchased a glass of iced tea for $2 and paid for it. And I was in there and nobody from the restaurant, Napolese restaurant, 30 South Marine Street, complained about me being in there. In fact, I was joking around with the, both the hostess Okay. I understand. Okay, I hold, this, hold. Let me just stop you for a second, because I, I know you want to move right into those charges, and we can definitely talk about that. Um, but I just wanted to make sure of a couple things before you start saying anything else. I know you're worried about your Fifth Amendment right, Sixth Amendment right, um, and so I also want to make sure you know that. Um, so after we talk, I'll be writing a report that will go to the court. Absolutely. I'm sure you're aware of it. And I'll be writing a report sure. also now. Yeah, absolutely. And so that report will go to the judge. It will go to your attorney if you have one. Mm -hmm. If not, it will go to you. Yes, ma'am. Um, and then it will also go to the prosecutor. Yes, ma'am. So anything that we talk about today won't won't be confidential because I'll send it in. Yes, ma'am. And, 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 and just to let you know, ma'am, actually Estelle requires a Miranda warning. So it really. Well, I'm not policed, and I'm not. Yeah, that's why you need to have your own counsel because really how this is being handled, and this is actually an education for me, <laughs> is that obviously people aren't since they've done a lot of these. Uh, the public defender's office is once again not doing its job, and it's not challenging these properly, and they're not requiring Miranda warnings before. Before people come in to do these. Right, because it's it's different. It's not a custodial that's interview. Not, that's not the way it says. Okay. It, that's, okay. The Supreme Court says And so I just want to let you know, and that's why I'm telling you that what you mm -hmm. talk to me about won't be confidential. Yes, ma'am. We'll go into court, judge, yes, your lawyer. Yes, ma'am. And I appreciate that. And also the prosecutor. Yes, ma'am. And, and I appreciate that. Okay. The, 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 the difference is, is this, is that I've stated this not only public, I've stated it to the mm -hmm. press, I've met okay. with reporters. So I've stated this across the board to everybody I can. Gotcha. Uh, so the bottom line is I understand that at 30 South Marine Street uh, on the 21st of June 2016. So let's back yes, up yes, before you get into the details of each one. Yes, so you have two cases. Yes, ma'am. I do. Okay. And so when, what are the charges related to the first case? Yes, ma'am. The first case is two counts of resisting arrest against two very large police officers and a count of trespassing in the Napoli's restaurant at 30 South Marine Street. And that, what was the date of that? That's 21 June 2016, ma'am. And, and then what's your second case? And actually, that was the day of the alleged offense. Mm -hmm. The charges were actually filed on the June 22nd, and just to let you know to be very clear sure, about that. Sure, sure. And what are the charges for your second case? Uh, so I said, yeah, okay, the first one I covered all, all together, all right. Yep. The second one is on the 25th of, I have to laugh about this one, the 25th of October mm -hmm. 2017. Okay. I was to attend a hearing on my dad's estate which was the, and you, you need to know the name of this, it's the estate of Philip Lloyd Kenworthy, or Philip L. Kenworthy, that's two L's for Philip, mm -hmm. 
L period Kenworthy K E N W O R T H Y right. in front of Judge Michael Keel in Marion County Superior Court Seven. Okay. On that day, I was uh, preparing that morning. I had actually went to live with my cousin for a couple of days in order to get work done there. I was preparing what's called a writ of prohibition, mm -hmm. which was to go to the judge and to opposing counsel, and there's two of them. There's the personal representative appointed by the judge, a buddy of his, and uh, the one representing my half-sister, which is the one that's part of organized crime. Okay. Former half-sister, I want to emphasize former. And the writ of prohibition was to stop the judge, to stay the proceedings, to stop the judge because there was missing money, hundreds of thousands of dollars of missing money from the estate. Uh, and it didn't, wasn't just a few dollars, it was hundreds of thousands of dollars missing money and property that had disappeared from the estate and wasn't accounted for. Um, and that, so I had asked, I had, was, when I came into the building, I was surrounded by three Marion County Sheriff deputies and who harassed me in the lobby of the, at the state, it was basically harassed me from going up to the, um, up to the uh, hearing that was at 1.30, I believe, I think it was definitely 1.30. And I had just gone over printing partners to print off the writ of prohibition and all the documents to serve on all of them and say, where this is going to the Supreme Court today, judge, you need to go before the Supreme Court and explain why this money is missing and how you're going to account for it and with your personal representative. To the Indian Supreme Court yes, or the U.S.? The Indian Supreme Court. Okay. Yeah, writ of prohibitions and, uh, prohibitions and mandamus go to the Indian Supreme Court gotcha. to have a judge to come before them and explain them why, to explain the allegations. Mm -hmm. And then it tells the judge to stop the proceedings in the process. Um, I then contacted the bailiff, and who's, her name is Jafai Johnson, and I'd already talked to her once that morning because something had happened that morning which I was concerned that I would not be able to get to the hearing because there was an attempt uh, that, uh, that was very serious with me that morning, and I, and I told her that if I didn't make it there that she should uh, contact a certain law enforcement agency that I was working with on this matter. In an attempt, I don't know what you mean by that. Well, I don't want to go into too many details. Um, have, do you know what, well, I, I suggest you go to YouTube, and mm -hmm. I think they still have it. I won't go to the site. I don't do anything on the web any longer. Okay. There is the ability to make, to take a microwave oven. Mm -hmm. You take the, mic the components of a microwave oven, and you break them down. And with that microwave oven and a capacitor, you can turn the microwave device, it actually microwaves food, into a weapon system. They're very, very common now. Okay, so hold on. I want to yes, make sure yes, I got that. So yes, you, you take the components of the microwave oven, mm -hmm. take them down, and then do you, what you, with it? You take them apart. Uh -huh. Okay, you can hook a capacitor. You know what a capacitor is, ma'am? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, good. You have an electrical background. You can put a capacitor to those devices. Okay. And the YouTube video shows you how to actually do that. And you can go then and take that microwave device, mm -hmm. and you can actually hit somebody, shoot somebody with it about from 100 yards out. And what, and what it feels like is all of a sudden it feels like it has a couple different feelings to it. First of all, you get lightheaded, you get nauseous, you start to have a tingling sensation, almost like a cell phone vibrating in your pocket. Mm -hmm. I don't know why that happens. And you start getting very dizzy where your legs do not work, you get very wobbly, and they, uh, you feel like you have to sit down. You feel like your legs get heavy and you have to sit down because you feel like you're, you're losing, not consciousness, but everything seems very weird or as far as strange. And has that happened to you? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And, and, and let me tell you, let me go back and just a little background on that. 27-year uh, Marine, mm -hmm. when we were, in, I was stationed in Djibouti, Africa, okay. in, uh, for a tour in August of 2010. I got there on August 1st. We, Camp Lemonade, and I, I always get it wrong, L-E-M-O-N-E-E, -E, I believe. It's French, and I don't speak French. Okay. Um, uh, with a task force in, in Africa. I was a lieutenant colonel. Um, we came under an electronic warfare attack during that period. And a what? What's electronic? electronic warfare. Okay. Yeah, we think of when we think of battle man, we think mm -hmm. of bullets and we think of tanks and all that kind of stuff. Right. The new age in battle now is not bullets and tanks and bombs and aircraft. It's taking microwave devices and hitting people with microwave. And the reason why that's so prevalent now, used by the Russians and the Cubans. Uh, uh, different uh, Iranians, the Syrians, and so on, is because there's no signature for it. Uh, with poison gas and biologicals, and they leave a signature in the system. Mm -hmm. A bullet leaves a signature in the system. Right? You get hit by a bullet, you can see a bullet wound. Right. You, you, 
uh, suck in poison gas, it has certain effects on your body. A biological does so certain why things. why do you think that you're being targeted? Yes, ma'am. Uh, the I was I had filed. If you look at this estate of Philip Kenworthy mm -hmm. in the guardianship, you will see that I filed several documents with that estate, saying there was missing money and there was fraud being perpetrated on the court. Okay. Uh, Kim Hallenstein Welch, ma'am, is engaged with a guy named C. David Dumond. And so who who are they in relation to you? Okay, Kim Hallenstein Welch is the daughter of my mother. Okay. And she was the stepdaughter of my father, Philip Lloyd Kenworthy. Okay. Okay. Uh, so she's a half sister. She's a half sister. Uh, she is employed by, besides being employed by Gregory Nasser, who runs an organized crime ring here in Indiana, and that's from three different sources that I have, and well, actually more than that, uh, multiple sources, but those are the mm -hmm. three that I can name without any kind of, they're on record. Mm -hmm. uh, his wife, a bank manager from Chase, where he was money laundering uh, money for his uh, used car lot and money and doing that, and they caught him, and then they didn't do anything against him, and I had that, uh, and then uh, Kim Hallenstein Welch, who uh, I told to get away from him and the organized crime ring because he's going to lose her son and, and go to jail. Kim uh, Welch, that's, uh, that's your half sister? The half sister, yes, okay, ma'am. Got it. Her name used to be, uh, she was born Kim Ann Myers, and then she, this is uh, on this marriage, she's Kim Hallenstein Welch. Uh, two different, different marriages hyphenated together. Um, she also works for a guy named C. Period David Dumond. Mm -hmm. Okay, he's an attorney who also runs around with the organized crime ring. I won't call him a consulary or one of those formal terms because I don't do organized crime. You know, I investigate it now to figure out what is actually going on here in Central Indiana. But David, C. David Dumond hung out in the illegal gambling places they had, and became friends with Kim Hallenstein Welch. Kim Hallenstein Welch, and I'm sorry if I'm going so fast here, ma'am. Kim Hallenstein Welch also was employed by C. David Dumont as doing administrative work for him. Mm -hmm. Okay? C. Period David Dumont has a wife by the name of Denise Dumont. Denise Dumont works for the probate court, Judge Stephen Eichholz, and also worked for a guy named Judge Zor, Z O R E. And by the way, just for the record, I want to state this since it's been recorded and since I'm stating it to somebody else. I had the highest opinion and highest regard for Judge David Zor, or not Judge Zor. I can't remember Judge Zor's first name. The highest regard for him. I practiced for him a couple times and thought he think he's an amazing judge. And I have nothing bad to say about him. But Denise Dumond worked for Judge Zor in charge of adoption records. Okay. She also worked for Judge Stephen Eichholz. I never knew that. There were a, a multiple proceedings in front of Judge. I called regarding my father, brought by C. David Dumond and Kim Hallenstein Welch against me, that I all prevailed on, and Judge I never once stated that C. David Dumond's wife worked for him, and that was the root of the whole problem of of causing mm -hmm. Judge I to have to recuse himself from my mm -hmm. dad's case to lead the case. He did some things that I believe I've told the state I told the state the Supreme Court that I believe are unethical. And that's how the case got down to Michael Keel. Okay, so yeah. I'm confused. Yes, ma'am, please. So you said there are multiple proceedings in front of Eichholz and he had to recuse himself. Yes, ma'am. So I guess I'm confused at how all that is related to um, the the hearing but, about yes, about the missing money and yes, all that. Okay, and, and I appreciate that. Okay. I, I, and, I, and I ask you to ask all kind of questions like that because... Sure, that, yeah, that, I'm that, trying to connect no, it or no, no, make no, sense No, 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 and you know what I am in? This is, uh, this is four years of my life. Okay. So it, I, I, I uh, have said this story so many times, mm -hmm. I've said the facts of this so many times, I just take it for granted that okay. I know what I'm talking about. So all this stuff has been going on for about four years Yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. Okay. I, I first took over my dad's guardianship in 2013. I was been taking care of him since really 2000. Well, 2011 when I got back out of the Marine Corps. Okay. Um, so um, uh, I came back and found him ill and started immediately start taking care of him. And then I actually got a guardianship on him in 2013. Um, this tied that back in together based on your question, man. Right. And the thing is this, Judge Eichholz never, under the guardianship proceedings, he inherited the guardianship of my father in 2015. At the same time he inherited my, and the reason being is Judge uh, Zor, um, his term ended, ma'am, uh, in the end of 2014. So let's say December 31st of 2014, he was no longer the probate judge of Marion County. Okay. 
on 1 January, Judge Stephen Eichholz became the probate judge of Marion County. When Judge Stephen Eichholz became the judge um, uh, for probate, C. David Dumond and Kim Howenstein Welch filed actions against me, against my dad, or against me for my guardianship, trying to force me to unplug my dad from a respirator that he was on because he had been he had been a subject to malpractice at St. Vincent's Hospital. And I had that all well documented, and he was on a respirator. They were trying to get me get me to unplug him early so he would die because my sister was desperate for money. She had filed bankruptcy. My dad had a large estate, close to a million dollars, and she was trying to force me to unplug him so he would die. And it was her. And she said he had lived long enough. He'd lived had this is quality of life, and he needed to die. And I fought her, and I won. He came off the respirator, and he lived. All right, he went to live on for another five months. But for the but for the problems that C. David Dumond and she caused me, he would have lived much longer than that. But they caused me all kinds of problems, kept uh, uh, harassing me in court the entire time when I was trying to get him well and get him back to good health. That's a whole other story. We won't mm -hmm. go into that. So, all those guardianship proceedings, man, where I was being challenged for my guardianship, and I won on all those. Mrs. Dumond, Denise Dumond, worked for Judge Eichholz. He never disclosed that the attorney that was arguing against me had, a, had an employee working for the court and had all the inside information that was going to the court to provide to her husband. I would have instantly demanded he recuse himself if I would have known that fact. Mm -hmm. And so what ended up happening? Well, what happened then, ma'am, yes, and th thank you. I, pray, I appreciate yes. the promise. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, for, I, Dr. Calloway, I'm sorry for calling you ma'am. That's fine. Um, my father passed, I don't get the date right, on April, April 7th, if I'm a day off, I apologize, on April 7th of 2015, my father died. My attorney and I arrived on the morning of April 8th, the next day, because he died at uh, right around 5, 5.30 in the afternoon at a, a place called Kinder on the south side, a transitional hospital. He was released from the hospital and he was transitioning out to a nursing home. Um, my, my attorney and I arrived in the Marion County Probate Court to file the estate papers to be the personal representative of the estate. We got there about a quarter till eight. Um, Kim Hallenstein Welch and her attorney showed up about five to ten minutes later. We'd already checked in and got in line. They, a guy named Robert Thompson Jr. showed up with Kim Hallenstein Welch about ten minutes later. He starts bickering with my attorney to say, hey, just because you're here first doesn't mean you get to go first. We're going to get a lower number, and they start going back and forth. I'm like, I can't believe this is going on. Bottom line is, it turns 8 o'clock. We're able to go and file and get 246 for our number. The first to file is usually the personal representative for the matter when there's not a will. My dad's will disappeared somehow magically. So I get number 246 in the matter, and... That means I'm the first to file. I should be given the personal representative to handle the estate. I've been taking care of my dad since 2011. He dies in 2015. Um, and I'm the son. I'm actually his son. Um, the, the judge then comes in about 10 after 8. He looks at my attorney, which at the time was Charles Gron. He looks at him and says, I need to see you back in my office. Charles Gron says, Judge, the other side's here. Do you want us to also speak with him? He said, yes. They both go back to the office. Charles Grand then comes out about 15 minutes later and says, you won't believe this. And I said, I ain't, with this case, I can believe anything. He said, David Dumont's, that's how it goes. That's why it goes by. He goes, David Dumont's wife, Denise, works for the judge. And I said, I never knew that. He said, I never knew that. And he said, okay. He said, she contacted the judge this morning and asked him to come in early in order to establish the estate with Kim Hallenstein Welch. And I said, okay. He said, he has decided he has to recuse himself. I said, okay. And I'm still on the fact that Denise DeMont works for him because nobody ever just told me that. And so from that point, that's how we lost then having everything in probate with a probate judge because then what Judge Eichholz does wrong, as soon as he says I have to recuse myself, he has to not do anything else in the case. And he told my lawyer that morning, 
I'm, I'm recused. I can't do it. I've had an ex parte communication with my court staff regarding the other side. I can no longer do anything. It, yet he does. He does orders after that that set up the case to go to, to set up the case so it can go over to Michael Keel, basically. And that's where he messes up. He doesn't disclose, number one, that he has Denise Dumond with him as a, uh, a wife of a uh, the guy practicing in front of him, which I would have known, I would have said you can't we're going to a different court. And the second thing is he actually does orders after he recuses himself that that I believe or are unethical. You, once you recuse yourself, you can't do anything else in the case, ma'am. And so then it ends up in front of Judge Keel, and yes, is that when you got your second set of charges? No. Uh, yes, well, and I was with Judge Michael Keel for mm -hmm. almost a couple of years. Okay. So that comes over, ma'am, in 15. Okay. Okay. And the second set of charges, ma'am, come in 17. Okay. So the case was in in his court for two years. Okay. For two years. And so then, what happened in 17 when yes. you ended up? Yes, ma'am. Getting additional charges. Yes, ma'am. And and, and 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 the court will pay you for this. And I'm all about people making money. Uh, please uh, ask the court to be able to review the files on this. I, I encourage you to. All right, because I've asked every press member to do so. Mm -hmm. um, you will find several filings from me with Judge Michael Keel's case. To cause the, to raise all kinds of abnormalities about how a probate case is to be done. I'm not a probate lawyer by any means, but there's certain the law says here's how certain things have to be done in a probate case with the state. A guy named Bryce Bennett Jr., which is a friend of Judge Michael Keel's and was appointed by Judge Michael Keel, who took the personal representative matter away from me, um, the did a slew of things wrong in the matter to include having missing money. And, and, oh, by the way, charging over $300,000 in attorney's fees uh, and, and representing himself during the matter, which you can't do. But I won't go into all that. That's not too much detail. Anyway, per blank, black and white, wrong things you cannot do as a personal representative. He did. He violated statute after statute after statute. But the big thing was Kim Hellenstein Welch files, I challenge the fact that she's not even an heir of my dad's estate because she's not his daughter. She, she was never adopted, and she was never... Uh, she's not born from him. And the reason why I know, I always assumed my sister was adopted by my dad because she had my last name when she was little. They just put Kenworthy on her and nobody questioned it. The difference was my dad and I had a conversation at the, at, towards the end of his life and we were talking about, I don't remember how it even came up, but he said her father, he always wanted, uh, he went to adopt her, but her dad would not, Mr. Rick, Rick, uh, Dick Myers, Richard Myers, would not cooperate in the matter. And I get, my guess was, from my, what my mom told me was, he was a, either a TWA or a United Airlines stewardess or flight attendant, okay? So he's always traveling around the world. And he, he was very, my dad stated he was a very uncooperative, unpleasant individual. And he couldn't get the guy to actually participate for the adoption. He wouldn't give his consent. Therefore, he never got to adopt Kim. Now, what I stated was, she throws up a birth certificate that has all kinds of red flags on it, including it's not a certified true copy, and I challenge that. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and so then sort of fast forward yes, to... The 27th? Or 25th? Yeah, okay. And, okay. What, and what happened when yes, you ended up... Yes, ma'am. If I could give you one more background, yeah, please. Sure, yes, sure. ma'am. I'm going to give you one more background, please, okay. if I may. Over time, over the course of the period, uh, over the course of the period, uh, Jafai Johnson's the bailiff, and I take bailiffs very seriously. They wear mm -hmm. badges... They're the they're people who control the courtroom. Okay. Uh, Jafai is extraordinarily nice to me the entire time. Uh, and she, she's very accommodating. She's very helpful. She's helpful with the files and so on. I won't say that we're friends because I don't want to put that on her. But she was nice to me. I was nice to her. And everything was fine. Always smiled. Uh, and I told her, I said, I told her on different occasions, I said, Jafai, this case is getting very dicey with things that are going wrong with it, okay? Make sure that you protect yourself in this matter so you can't be seen as doing anything wrong in this matter because there were things missing on the file, the files were, files were, were flipped around and all that kind of stuff. It didn't make any sense what was going on with the file. I said, you need to make sure nobody can look at you and cast an appearance of impropriety on you. Uh, I told her on different occasions over the two-year period because this file is a mess. Um, I then, uh, and so and in the file, ma'am, during the course of the proceedings, I went and I... Um, filed different things where I said there were fraud, fraud on the court. And the, the big, the one fraud on the court that I alleged, besides what Bryce Bennett was doing wrong, Bryce Bennett Jr. was doing wrong, with filing statute and, and, and money missing and all that kind of thing, I had stated definitively that the birth certificate that she submitted to the 
court was a fraudulent document. It lists my father as her, as her parent. It lists Philip Kenworthy as her dad. Now, it's interesting about that. You can only get a birth certificate like that on two ways. Number one, you can get a birth certificate saying that Philip Kenworthy is her dad if one, he actually is her dad, right? He says, I'm her dad, and it goes on the birth certificate. The second way is if he adopts her. If he adopts her, it can go, they can do a birth certificate that says that's her dad. Strange to do it that way, in my opinion. What I know was, though, from my dealings, is that I know for a fact I had court documents that I submitted to the, to the court that showed that Richard, Rick Myers, Richard Myers was her father because I have my mom and dad, or my, I have my mom's divorce decree from Richard Myers. It has Kim Ann Myers as K Y M M A N N E Myers, which is my sister's spelling for Kim Ann, as, and my mom's name, which is her mother, mm -hmm. as the product of that marriage, okay? Uh, that is definitively stated in her divorce documents with him, all right? And my sister is, uh, my former sister is, half sister is three years older than I am. Uh, and I had that from her report cards that I had with mine. The birth certificate then, and then what she provides for, for one document, which I believe is, I, I, I will state, I have stated firmly it's a fraudulent document. And again, remember, Denise Dumont worked in okay. adoption records, okay? Worked in adoption records, so, so she has access to the system. That the document she provided is fraudulent. And it's not a certified true copy or anything else. What I asked for, ma'am, was I wanted to attack the accounting on the case, which was on the schedule for October 25th. I was going to go in there and argue, one, judge, this accounting doesn't comply to statute. There's missing money. There's missing property. There's things that were stolen from the house that aren't accounted for, hundreds of thousands of dollars. One bed, that the antique bed, the only other copy of it is in the White House in the, uh, in the uh, Lincoln bedroom. It's considered the Lincoln bed. And that was my dad's bed because... My, gra my great uncle had it, but that's a different story, and that's, a, that's already been shown. Um, but the uh, detective county, and then also what he, which the judge did, and which he couldn't do, Michael Keel, I demanded the, demanded, I requested the hearing on her airship, on her being heir, way back I believe in May of 2017, and he had like a month to hold a hearing, a hearing on that matter to say whether or not she's an heir. He wouldn't hold the hearing. He wouldn't say the proceedings to determine heirship. That's a fundamental thing in a probate case to figure who the heirs are. And so then what happened yes, that day when you ended up going in court? Yes, ma'am. Well, what I did then, ma'am, was I prepared a writ of certiorari, or mm -hmm. a writ of prohibition, to go to the Supreme Court of the state of Indiana mm -hmm. to say, Judge Keel, here are allegations against you by Mr. Kenworthy, saying all these things were done wrong. Gotcha. Uh, and he wants the case to be stopped pending our review of the matter to make sure you as a judge have not failed in your, 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 your duty as a judge. Mm -hmm. That statute, ma'am, requires me to do three things. It requires me to serve one on the judge, it requires me to serve one on the personal representative, and it requires me to serve one on uh, Kim Ann Meyer, Kim Ann, excuse me, Hallenstein Welch's uh, attorney, which is Robert Thompson, Jr. Okay? The two lawyers, Bryce Bennett, Jr. and Robert Thompson, Jr., ma'am, are in the courtroom with the judge. My job is to take the stack of papers, like this thick, each one of them, multiple copies, and I'm taking up to hand them to them and mm -hmm. saying, Judge, you are so served. Because I have to tell the court that I've done that personally. I come in the, I come in the west entrance to the City County building. Immediately when I come in, the guy behind the TS, or I call it TSA, the security okay. situation, ma'am, I'm sorry, I don't know, uh, building security, he mics up. He gets on his mic, he sees me, and he mics up. Individuals then come out, two other individuals then come out of the security room and they start coming on me. Because I had been harassed before on multiple occasions by the Sheriff's Department, because I filed allegations against the Sheriff's Department for on different things, for abuse of prisoners and for um, abuse of prisoners and for not having proper building security, allowing metal through the metal detector undetected. Uh, they, have, they started harassing me after May of 2000 in Boy, what year was that? May of 2016, they started causing me problems when I tried to come in the building after I went to Channel 6 and said, they're, I have told them that they're allowing, I see metal going through with people and it's not setting up the alarms. Channel 6 called them up and said, hey, are you doing this? Uh, and they changed the proceedings. That's when the sheriff had to actually go on and be the person and so on. But after that, they started getting nasty with me every time I came through the building. 
They surrounded me. I said, I'm not going to go up with you. I'm not going to have you get me on the elevator and say I've resisted arrest or something like that. I'm going to have an escort. And that time, ma'am, I called to Jafai Johnson. I have her telephone number in my phone. I called to Jafai Johnson. I said, Jafai, would you come down and actually escort me up? I'm having problems with the sheriff's department down here. Would you come down and would you be with me as we go up the elevator of the stairs to be my personal representative, or not my personal representative, that's not right, to be my eyes and ears to see, to be a witness, if you will, that there's no, I haven't done anything wrong to go to the courtroom. She said, Craig, let me go check with the judge and see if he's okay with that. She goes back, she's gone a couple of minutes, she comes back, she says, the judge will not allow me to come down and, uh, and, and, and do that. I said, okay. I said, well, I, I can't attend the hearing. I said, I refuse to get in an elevator with these gentlemen and have something happen in the elevator where they said that I've done something wrong and all of a sudden I end up handcuffed today and end up in jail. I don't have the, the system around me to get me bailed out and everything else. So I, couldn't attend, I could not attend my own hearing to challenge the accounting, the missing hundreds of thousands of dollars in the, in the estate, the missing property, the missing weapons system, the missing guns that were taken on my dad's gun collection, uh, all the things I had found wrong. And I'm happy to provide you with a copy of that, ma'am, in a heartbeat. Okay, I have a copy available. I'll give you that one today if you'd like it. It's about this thick, and it's, it's very illuminating. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and it, it was filed... Uh, Oh, it was never filed with the court because I could never get them served on the other side. And so when ended up happening? Oh, yes, oh, yes ma'am. So anyways, her, our last conversation, ma'am, was, I can't, Craig, I can't come down because the judge won't let me. And I said, okay. I went back to printing partner for my the gentleman that was out there. He said, I'm here, mm -hmm. he, and my driver. Uh, he said, I went back, met with him, and we got in the car and left. And, oh, and that's not, that's not accurate. Let me get one, one more situation. I'll let me add to that, ma'am. There's a guy named Michael Hollis who's the deputy clerk of court for Marion County, right? Great guy. He works for the clerk of court, Ms. Mm -hmm. Eldridge. I had been working with him on making sure that he was aware of things that were going wrong in the court system here in Marion County because I didn't want Ms. Eldridge to be held accountable for things that were going wrong. Mr. Hollis, when I came in, I wanted to give him a copy of the writ of prohibition that I was going to file on Judge Keel. I was going to basically, you know, the one I was going to serve that day, I wanted him to have a copy of it for his records to say you need to be aware of what's going on in Judge and Superior Court 7 to make sure that Ms. Eldridge was protected so nothing could ever go back to her to harm her in, in as far as appearances are wanted for her elections. So I came back in the building, ma'am, mm -hmm. a half an hour later after, after uh, leaving and after Jafai Johnson said that I could, she could not come down and help me to get upstairs. Uh, I came back in the building, into the west side in the same area. They might again, they all came out again. Michael Hollis was waiting for me, and I handed the documents to Michael Hollis. Now, you would think if anything had been wrong during that conversation between me and Jafai, they would have cuffed me right then and there. They would have said, something went wrong, and we're cuffing you, and we're taking you to custody. They saw me a second time. They had another security response on me, and nothing happened. So I get the document to Michael Hollis. There's a video of that on the 25th of October that say probably about there should be video on all of this. I need to actually request that, actually. Uh, the building security will have a video of all of this, on the 25th of October of 2017. Now, uh, I give that document to, to Michael Hollis. I leave. I go back to my uh, to uh, Greg's home. Um, on the 30th of October, ma'am, on the 30th of October, the following Monday, I am in court, and I am in court, and uh, I'm in court for the Napoli's restaurant matter. Okay, the one that happened on the uh, 21st of June. Right. While I'm in there, we have some preliminary discussions. And the prosecution side, Mr. Fogel, which is the chief deputy prosecutor, I understand, and Mr. Cunningham, which is high up also. I've got four different, pro actually five prosecutors working on this case with me. Mr. Curry, Mr. Fogel, Mr. Cunningham, Mary Ann Fleetwood, and a fifth one that I never can remember her name. So five prosecutors against me. I must be really a powerful guy and I don't realize it. I'm saying that sarcastically. Um, I'm in there on the Monday, and I'm not thinking anything's going to go wrong. I mean, I'd already filed my, my exhibit list and my witness list, and Mr. Fogel, I believe it was, who spoke on the record that day, said, Judge, we, uh, we would like to go over the exhibit list uh, and the witness list, and I'm very excited about my exhibit list and my witness list, and I said, absolutely, Judge, I'm enthusiastic about speaking about that the exhibit list and the, and the, and the witness list enthusiastic about talking about it. Immediately after that, 
Mr. Fogel then says to the judge, well, judge, we have some new charges on Mr. Kenworthy, and we would like you to issue a warrant for his arrest, his immediate arrest. Uh, and I'm looking around like, what, what could have happened? What, what, what happened? And they said, he has threatened court staff in Superior Court 7, and based on that, uh, we would like him to be arrested immediately and, uh, and detained. I'm, I always have escorts with me for the most part when I come to this building to make sure I'm not harassed uh, and things don't happen. Uh, I had a Marine, a retired Marine, or not retired Marine, a Marine from the Korean War with me that day to make sure he could witness everything that happened in the courtroom by the name of Jack Woolen, a friend of my father's. And so he's with me and all of a sudden the, the, they ask me to step outside. Uh, the judge signs an arrest warrant right then and I am handcuffed and taken into custody. I am then charged the next day with threatening Jafai Johnson the woman who smiles at me every day when I'm in there and I smile back at her and think she's wonderful, that I had somehow threatened her, somehow I told her that somebody was going to, according to the allegation, ma'am, that I told her that somebody was going to die that day and that, uh, and that therefore, uh, that somehow there was supposed to be some kind of threat. All I told her was is this, ma'am, I had, while working at Greg's house, I had received a the same kind of situation I had gotten in Djibouti, Africa, when we had the electronic warfare attack, where all of a sudden I got very dizzy, I got very lightheaded, I got my legs felt rubbery. I even told Greg, which is the guy out there, uh, Greg, you might actually have to help me down your stairs for your third floor building because I don't feel, I am having trouble walking right now. And he almost had to help me out to his car. And I told Jafai when that happened is that Javai, I don't know if I'm going to make it into the hearing because I'm trying to get there. I didn't know if he's going to have to take me into the hospital because of how bad I was feeling because I was having a hard time staying conscious. But I said, if, if I do, don't, don't make it in, and you find out that something's happened to me where I haven't made it through today because I felt so bad, I said, please contact the Virginia State Police because I'm working with them on a case out there regarding a shoot down of their helicopter that killed two police officers. And that goes into a different situation. My contacts regarding Greg Nasser, ma'am, organized crime, have told me, these are the confidential informants for them, have told me that Greg Nasser's organized crime group have infiltrated a place called Raytheon Electronics. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. It's the old Napoleonic Center. Raytheon, one of their missions, they have like 14 to 16 missions there, different projects they work on. One of their missions is providing electronic warfare for shooting down drones. Okay, so very powerful microwave. It's not like you shoot a bullet at a, at a drone, you shoot an electronic pulse at a, at, a, at a drone, and that electronic pulse overwhelms the electronics of that drone and it crashes. And that's on the, and that's on the record now. And so in terms of the electronic warfare, when did your concerns first start about that? Um, well, hmm, okay. Well, that's it's okay. Like was that in Djibouti that they first started? Well, well yeah, yes, ma'am. In, in Djibouti, um, let, me go, let me give you a little background there if you don't mind. The, we have had, we have court marshals, Marine Lieutenant Colonel, okay, I did, I was an SJA when I was on active duty, and then I did reserve uh, time after that as an infantry officer, and as an uh, executive officer of a rifle battalion, and then as a planner. Okay, what? Rifle battalion, executive oh, officer. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so, um, so, we have had Marines who have been court marshals, and you don't understand what that is, right? Yep. They've been prosecuted for taking microwave antennas mm -hmm. with their electronic touch line and actually fire them at one another. People do it sometimes out of being thinking they're playful. Other times they do it out of spite. But if you take a microwave parabolic antenna mm -hmm. and you point it at somebody and you energize it, you can, you can do a lot of damage. And it's not one court martial, it's not two court martials. There's been dozens of court martials for the attack of another individual, another Marine or sailor, by a Marine using a parabolic dish. It's not something that's rare. It's not something that's common, but it's, it's something that I have heard of multiple times. And if you see somebody with a parabolic dish, you make sure you stay out of the way of that parabolic dish. And we consider all kinds of transmissions very deadly with parabolic dishes. So I'm aware from my marine time, from being a lieutenant on to lieutenant mm -hmm. colonel, that microwave transmissions are very, very dangerous stuff. I'm going to be careful what I say about Djibouti. I have been on the record of trying to get this investigated by Headquarters Marine Corps, by the Inspector General's office, by a woman by the name of Cynthia Edwards, who's head of investigations for that. I have sent stuff to the Office of Communications, which handles the briefings for Judge, or to Judge, for uh, Commandant General Neller, and actually his, his, type, or his rank is General Neller, four star. His title is Commandant of the Marine Corps, and I have worked for him in the past. 
to actually get them to look into what happened in Djibouti and what might be happening with situations now regarding uh, the use of, of uh, systems that were once classified to harm people because they have to, since, and I can go in that in a different way in a second. But I have tried to get people to look into this because it's so darn dangerous. Um, but my contacts, my confidential source has told me your problem's coming from Raytheon because they've infiltrated Raytheon out there with people who work in Raytheon. One source said it was a maintenance person was able to get stuff out the door somehow by saying it was stopped, marking it as a stuff that was to be recycled or that was uh, no longer uh, active. Other people were telling me it was actual people that were uh, people who worked for Raytheon that had been compromised. And the, and yes, so with all of this stuff, I mean, is it being directed towards you or just happening and you're worried about it? Oh, no, ma'am. No, ma'am. It's not. It, no, ma'am. Uh, my understanding is, uh, and this is something that's is quite alarming to me, mm -hmm. is that electronic warfare now is the new way of doing extortion uh, in the United States. And that's from my sources now. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I can, based on my, my experiences in Djibouti, I can recognize when somebody's doing electronic eavesdropping through microwave radiation, or I can see usually there are certain anomalies that are caused based on when a strong microwave pulse is given. It has a certain signature that it provides. You know what I mean? I mean my signature, correct? Mm -hmm. okay. All right. So there are certain signatures that are that are done based on microwave, and the stronger the pulse, the better, the, the more pronounced the signature. Mm -hmm. A building that's being microwaved for purposes of eavesdropping, because that's how you, what, you can use microwave radiation for purposes of listening to people's conversations in electronics. And I know that for a fact, based on my time in the Marine Corps, uh, that, that a, a glass and metal building, Dr. Calloway, will present a certain signature. Concrete won't do it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, brick won't do it. Cement won't do it. Stone will not do it. But with every word that's glass and metal, it has a certain shimmer to it that almost looks like evaporating water. And I don't know why it is, but for some reason, the microwave reacts with the glass and the metal to take anything that has liquid in it, uh, any moisture in the air, and it causes it to almost have like, where you see that a evaporating uh, steam coming off a hot uh, asphalt during the summertime. You know, you see like that mirage. Right. It happens about two to three inches off the building and it shimmers up. So do you feel like any of this sort of eavesdropping or, or monitoring is going on with you specifically? Uh, Ma'am, I, I could, let's, no. Um, eavesdropping, I can, I can only tell you that after my father died, mm -hmm. my, that computer right here is a Microsoft Surface Pro. Yeah. My ThinkPad, which was a, uh, a IBM ThinkPad that had uh, XP on it, Microsoft Pro that had Windows 10 on it, and my printer, which is an HP printer, mm -hmm. all started, got, they got, went under an electronic attack, a hack, and they all got wiped out. I was able to redo my Surface and get it operational again with problems. I was never able to revive my printer. My printer was hard down and I still can't use it. I can only make copies at times, but as a printer it won't work. And my ThinkPad is completely wiped out. It, the operating system was completely destroyed. I had it for over 15 years, loved it. And it was completely destroyed and, I can, and I'm working with Fry's Electronics in order to find a way for them to recover the data off of it and try to restore an operating system on it. And, and I'm working with their, uh, their guys, their techs on that. Gotcha. Okay, so I know I went under an electron, oh, and my, my Nokia, I think it's called a 1020, my Nokia 1020 Microsoft Windows phone mm -hmm. from AT&T went under a bizarre attack where the time was changing on the phone, the, um, my alarms were being changed, I could not make telephone calls at my desire to call out to people, um, my contacts were being erased at times. I could actually watch programs being downloaded on it uh, as I watched when I knew I wasn't doing any downloading. And the, in fact, the night that I was at the FBI office at, behind Castle Square to say, to talk about the NASA group and was meeting with the analysts who wouldn't take any information regarding from me on the NASA group, uh, I was actually said, you need to take my phone and actually run it for uh, forensic for, for malware because I'm actually watching a program right when I walk in here being downloaded onto the phone, which I'm not providing. I'm not allowing it to happen. So, um, so, so that kind of electronic attack, yes, yes, mm -hmm. ma'am. Uh, I know that when I was in Djibouti, I went back to Djibouti in 2010, that we lost a guy, and I don't know if he died or he we had, he had to be medically evacuated, who was a con, uh, a sailor. Construction Battalion, CB, that we had, I was his XO, 
we lost a guy two days before that uh, during the electronic attack that he had all the signatures, if you will, personal signatures, biological signatures, of uh, somebody who was microwaved to an extent that he dropped. And he, two days before, I had to be medically evacuated for what's called a uh, cavernous angioma. You know, are you familiar with that? Is? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I had a blood vessel two days later in my lower brain stem, in my right pond, my lower brain stem, that was imaged in Longstuhl, Germany, when they flew me out, that was at 1.4 by 1.2 centimeters. Okay? And that was in the right pond. So that messed up my sleep cycles and everything else and caused an extraordinary amount of pain, light sensitivity, and um, audio sensitivity in my so body. So that was in 2010? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. What did they end up doing with that? They couldn't. Uh, I went to uh, Bethesda. Mm -hmm. I did only four days inpatient at Bethesda. I did a month and a half outpatient. Uh, everything from MRIs with contrast, ma'am, mm -hmm. to a full body PET scan. Uh, the situation, I, I'm going to make an assumption here, okay, this is not factual, I'm going to give you my assumption based on everything I saw. Sure. Uh, they probably did, I would say, I'm guessing a million to two million dollars worth of tests on me. Okay. And the reason they did that was the situation was so serious, it happened in the Horn of Africa at CUTF HOA, Combined Joint Task Force Horn of Africa, that they wanted to find out everything about my body they possibly could. So they did spinal fluid taps, they did a three-day in-bed EEG, where I was in bed, uh, uh, and had an EEG run for three days, uh, full body PET scan. Uh, I did five MRIs with contrast over a period of six months, seven months. Uh, I uh, had uh, uh, special EEGs that dealt with eyes, special EEGs that deal, dealt with hearing. Um, it was a month and a half of tests. Mm -hmm. And a uh, full tox screen. Uh, they did everything they could. They sent my, they said they were going to, they said my thing was so, uh, they said my thing had to be so examined, they were sending my spinal fluid to a special lab to make sure that it was the best lab in the world with dealing with spinal fluid because they had to make sure they understood exactly what was going on with my spinal fluid. The, the neurologist, the neurosurgeon for Bethesda, who was a commander, Navy commander if you know the ranks, uh, he told me there was nothing he could do for me because of the fact that if he stuck the needle in my brain to deal with the cavernous angioma, that I had a more than likely chance of being a paraplegic for the rest of my life. And he said the risk was too high to do that because he thought for sure that I would not have any feeling from my neck down. And, and, the, and you being, uh, have studied medicine and so on, you understand the axon nerve, the right axon nerve and the left axon nerve. The blood vessel that had swollen and actually leaked blood had penetrated the blood-brain barrier and had leaked blood into my ponds, my right ponds of my brain stem. That pressure was building up on my right axon nerve and, and also pushing to my left axon nerve. So everything, I had pain going up into my brain where the axon nerves going into the right and left hemisphere of the brain. It's also then causing, I don't know what the proper term is, I have to defer to you on it, but it was causing um, unpredictable pain mm -hmm. to come into my body throughout my body. So I'd have a stabbing pain based on how I turned or whatever, where the pressure would hit the nerve just right, and all of a sudden it'd feel like I have like an ice pick shoved into my leg, or an ice pick shoved into my foot, or an ice pick shoved into my back. And the problem with that is I could never, if I was like talking to you right now and during that time period, I might double over in pain really fast, and then I have to explain to you the whole thing that we're explaining to you now. Once so I tried to keep it a secret, I didn't want people to know that I had anything, a blood vessel in my brain. Mm -hmm. But then I'd do something, and people say, what's going on? And I'd say, well, I have a pond situation and all that kind of stuff, and they say, wow, okay. So, so, I went through that for a year and a half of that kind of pain, uh, light sensitivity for about three or four months, uh, audio sensitivity, like I had a severe hangover for three or four months after that time period. The pain, the shooting pains were with me for about a year, actually about 14 months to be accurate, not a year and a half, 14 months. And eventually, it dissipated down, and it dissipated down to my understanding in April of 2014, I said, it's not right. April of 2016, I apologize. April of 2016, I got another MRI and it was down to nine millimeters, but still at times causing me a little bit of pain and problems. Um, and it, it mostly, uh, it deals with, uh, it deals with the idea of shooting pains, which people will see me at times trying to get my neck just right, because I, what I have to do is I have to do a special stretch where I try to move my head around and all of a sudden the pain will go away. And I drink inordinate amounts of coffee because the more caffeine I push in my body, 
uh, the less chance I have for any kind of shooting pains in my body. I don't know why. Also, balsamic vinegar works beautifully for some reason. Uh, so I eat certain things to keep the pain down, and I drink I drink as much coffee as I can put in my body during the daytime, as much as I can afford. How much do you usually drink during the day? Uh, if I can afford it. Yeah. If I could, if, if I'm eating shooting pains in my body mm -hmm. and I can afford it, I'll do up to four or five cups a day. Okay. There's a certain Starbucks coffee that is um, that I do. It's called a mocha that mm -hmm. combines chocolate with coffee. Coffee by itself doesn't do that good of a thing. Chocolate mm -hmm. by itself doesn't do that good thing. The combination of chocolate and coffee, for some reason, keeps me from having any kind of shooting pains in my body. Gotcha. And then do they put, like, do they have espresso shots in there? Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Very yeah. important. So, like, how many espresso shots do you usually do in the coffee? Well, just one, just one. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I do as little as I can. And in, in, in for logistics purposes, or I should say for necessity purposes, ma'am, mm -hmm. if one does a job, I'm fine with that. I don't drink coffee just to drink coffee. But if I'm in pain and for some reason this thing is acting up, mm -hmm. what I will do then is I will, I will drink coffee until the pain goes away, if I can afford it. Gotcha. But $20 a day is not a good situation to go through, okay? Right. And for some reason, other coffees don't do as well as that Starbucks combination. I tried, this to decide, I'm, I'm really digressing here, I'm going off point, but you bring up a point with the espresso. I tried to take coffee and just make my own at home mm -hmm. to make it a lot cheaper, and I didn't realize that mocha is made with espresso. And finally, I figured that out because I wasn't getting the same effect. Mm -hmm. and I finally fire started buying espresso then to make it at home, and so I try to do it at home also, so I don't have to buy it from Starbucks and pay that big cost. Gotcha. Okay? And so, are, do you usually get medical treatment anywhere? No, ma'am. Okay, uh, are you getting medical treatment at all? Well, no, ma'am. And the and thing is, is this, uh, mm -hmm. and that's the reason this is something I should have uh, approached with you at the beginning, because to make sure you don't have a conflict of, conflict of interest. Um, the, I went in, when I had, when I was roughed up by Gregory Nasher's group in 2015, in December of 2015, mm -hmm. Uh, I was, I after in 15 or 16. Two, 2015, ma'am. Okay, gotcha. All right, this is this is uh, my dad died in April. Things mm -hmm. got started getting interesting after that. Uh, in 2015, April 2015, I was uh, sorry, my dad date died in April 2015. In mm -hmm. December 2015, before the big hearing uh, with Judge Keel, mm -hmm. I was roughed up, and I and I'm using that term minimally. I'll go into details as you like. Um, I was roughed up by his group. Every indication was it was his group, mm -hmm. uh, and, and it, it all adds up because my understanding is Kim Hallenstein Welch owes him an inordinate amount of money. Okay, and so you ended up getting treated. Where did you get treated? The VA. Okay. I went at, at Radebush. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I went there on two different occasions mm -hmm. to the to the emergency room, uh, and and what happened to me in Djibouti, Africa, ma'am, when I got hit with my, the microwave there? Mm -hmm. uh, one of the symptoms, and this is also, if you would be so kind. Look at what happened to the American embassy workers in Cuba. Mm -hmm. They had 21, 21 casualties. They had to evacuate the embassy, and they all had the same symptoms that I have with the microwave. That's what happened to them in Cuba. I have no doubt in my mind. Anyway, one of the symptoms you have that for myself and other people have already reported this is you have a numbness below the waist into your legs. And I call it rubber legs. It's where you stand up and you almost want to fall mm -hmm. down because your legs aren't working properly. And then is that why you went to the ER then? Well. I had multiple, after I got roughed up, I had multiple things going on. Um, they used a, uh, write, write this down if you would please, because this is what my contact told me. Mm -hmm. They uh, being Nasser's group? Yeah, well, I have contacts inside the group who want me to win against this group because they're so brutal. They're brutalizing women across, uh, uh, well, I think across the country. He's, he's, it's almost like he's a franchise. And the people who have come to me who have risked their lives in coming to me are people who want this to shut down because they're doing things that are beyond the pale of brutalizing women. Okay. Uh, they take a woman who looks like a celebrity mm -hmm. uh, and they if they don't have strong family contacts or friend contacts, that woman will disappear. They'll then turn that woman into a prostitution so that a guy can come and be with someone who looks like a celebrity. Uh, and that's happening across the country, but he's opened that franchise up here in central Indiana. So you can have uh, Meg Ryan. So you can have uh, uh, who's the one who played in the the Indiana Jones movie? Uh, I can't their name right now. Uh, there's different ones that they that they will broadcast out that they have that kind of escort. Okay. Um, and and so uh, I, I want to finish my thought if I can, okay. if you don't mind. Um, but I they use a transcranial magnetic stimulation is an imaging device. They used a transcranial what? It's called transcranial. Mm -hmm. magnetic stimulation. 
Okay, who used that? Okay, that's what the Nazar group used. And On you? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And the reason why, and the reason why that, the only reason why that makes sense, mm -hmm. there's also another term for it, ma'am. It's called transcranial magnetic simulation. Okay. Two, last two words are different. Mm -hmm. One stimulation, one right. simulation. When I started researching this, after I started getting input, what, what happened? Because they used a device on me that caused severe cramping. I thought it was ultrasound. Okay. Okay? And the device, when they put it on me, it's able to cause cramping of the bowels. They were able to cramp my liver, my pancreas. When they cramped my pancreas, it caused very bad things to happen with my brain. Uh, when they cramped my bowels, it felt like my bowels were being torn apart, actually being ripped up. Uh, and it would cause bad things to happen in as far as you can imagine it's an elimination process, right. okay? Uh, they, they, they did it with my kidneys and caused my kidney to have, my back to have severe pain. They would do it with my brain and it would feel like, and this is the only way I can describe it if it makes sense to you. It felt like somebody adding masking tape to the top of your head in layers, one layer after another, till it felt like your head was getting thick and your brain was almost like getting concrete in it. And I kept looking up the term they first used with me, ma'am, with Dr. Calloway, mm -hmm. was simulation. I kept looking up simulation, and they kept saying this is an imaging device used for purposes of looking at electrical, electrical impulses inside the brain, or looking at the, how the brain operates and so on. I finally learned the word stimulation, and I thought, you know, I thought they were wrong. I thought, simulation, this is an add up, because I, think, I thought it was ultrasound they were using. And I've been ultrasound before, and I never had any problems with it, but I guess, you know, if you turn it up high enough, you can do some damage to people. I don't know. I'm not a doctor. But I finally used, worked with the word stimulation because I saw it in the book and it said uh, electro, or electro, let's see, magnetic, transcranial magnetic stimulation. Mm -hmm. And when I looked that up, they said it's used by a wand, and that's the key. Because the device they were using, how it felt, you could almost feel a a wave front, the way it actually would react with your body, it wasn't like a square or a circle or a pin. It actually had a elongated, it was elongated. It was, the only way I could describe it, because I never saw it, because I was, I was goggled. They had uh, uh, goggles on me. The only way I could describe it was by the feel of it, it was almost like somebody had a curling iron, uh, what do you call it, a uh, curling iron, your little curling mm -hmm. iron one used to use. That's the way I kept imagining it in my mind, saying this thing is the, the wave front is very elongated on it. And that's when I looked at the term stimulation, that's where I knew, okay, they, and they say it's used with a one, I said that's got to be it. And so they roughed you up and then you ended up at the VA. On two occasions. ER, maybe. two occasions. Have you ever been to the VA for mental health treatment at all? What they did, ma'am, was they, I want to be very clear about this, this is, and this is why we got to get straight on this, mm -hmm. is the fact that the I told them that I was having the same symptoms after being roughed up as I had in Djibouti. Okay. Legs wouldn't work. I had the thickness, all those things I described earlier, mm -hmm. right? The, I told them I needed an MRI with contrast in order to see what the situation was in my brain. Mm -hmm. Okay? They would never give me an MRI with contrast. And that's where I have, I had a lawsuit against the, against the VA for it. I'm still going after doctor's licenses at the VA. Gotcha. And so you worked for the VA, all right? That is correct. And, and, you may have, and you may have worked for the VA at that time. And the fact is I, I've already met with the VA administration gotcha. to tell them that I'm going after their hospital. And mm -hmm. I've told everybody who listened to me that I think Radebush is a lousy facility. Gotcha. Because and so you ended up there. Did you get mental health treatment as well as no medical treatment? No, ma'am. What they did, mm -hmm. what they did instead of giving me, I never had any treatment, what they did mm -hmm. instead of, Putting me, giving me the MRI and putting me in a medical ward because I had a history. They could have right. pulled my medical records up and found the 1.2.1.4, okay? What they did is they just put me up in 5E and, and didn't do anything with me there. What's 5E? I have no idea. It's just a place where they just Is had it a mental health unit or is it a medical unit? I have no idea, ma'am. All, okay. all I did was sit up there and eat food and held there, and I was told there, you, I told them, I said, you don't let me go. I'm going to sue the living daylights out of you because you and can't so hold me. And so did they keep you there even though you didn't want to be? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And, and they never... Did they put you on some type of commitment? Then? No, no, ma'am. They never got a court order. They never got anything. Okay. And I told them, and this is where, this is where I've uh, gone to both senators. Uh, I went to the third senator. I've gone to all my senators. I, I haven't gone to Andre Carson. But I've gone to the senators. I've gone to the press and stuff. 
And I said, what's going on out there is just plain wrong. You can't do this to people. You can't hold somebody against their will without any immediate detention or emergency detention. They never had them. Okay. And how long did they keep you there? Uh, well, the, you know, ma'am, I think a, a, a couple of days, and I told them you can't do this, and they okay, let me go. So for like 72 hours then, or like so they, they would do it, Well, until I said, you're going to get sued, okay. because they, I said, you can't hold me, you can't hold me here. Okay. And they never did the MRI with contrast. Finally, finally, I get with neurology, mm -hmm. they do the MRI with contrast, and guess what? I've got a 9 millimeter cavernous angioma, the swamp in my brain that has a flare, as you know what that means, mm -hmm. right? A flare in the, in the x-ray that shows what? That shows that I had uh, another blood-brain barrier leakage, and that's the April after the being roughed up by them. Oh, by the way, the and this is another issue you need to know, mm -hmm. the organized crime leader, Gary Nasser, yes. his brother's a doctor who, my understanding from everything I've researched, works at Eskenazi Hospital and has rights to VA. And this is where you just can't make, and both by way, and I have nothing against Syrians in the past, mm -hmm. even though they came into Iraq trying to kill us at all times, all right, when I, when I served in Iraq, is that both Greg Nasser and his brother, who Greg Nasser is not his real name, it's a fear and a theme Nasser. Uh, theme is the doctor, a fear is Greg Nasser's mm -hmm. real name. Uh, uh, both born in Damascus, Syria, and come in here, one is a doctor, one is the organized crime leader. So what does that have to do with Well, if he has access to the VA, uh -huh. and he has access to Eskenazi, I don't know, you know, if, I, 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 until I get direct evidence, right? Okay, but you have some concerns that they're oh, linked to what happened with you? I have concerns that since Greg Nasser is so overt with organized crime, mm -hmm. and, he, and everybody seems to know it, uh, that I'm concerned in what, how it taints Mr. Dr. Nasser or Fiend Nasser. Got it. Okay. Um, any point in your life you've had any kind of mental health treatment? No, ma'am. Okay. No, ma'am. And here's the thing. Well, let me ask you. Let me tell you this, ma'am. When I came out of Djibouti, Africa, mm -hmm. when I came out of Djibouti, Africa, uh, a million and a half, two million dollars of tests, right? Mm -hmm. I went through. I had three psychiatrists that came out and said, "This is part of the program we have to do. Mm -hmm. To you know, we, we have to check you out on every level of everything. We're going to sit down and talk to you about everything we can." And they ruled me cleared. Okay. Okay. And that's right. That's right. So was that after you left the military they cleared you, or that was when you came back from Djibouti? When I came back from Djibouti, they okay. cleared me. But they never. There was. I worked for the military then for another five months, six months, and never after that ever had any kind of issues being brought up. Okay. And so no mental health treatment during service. No, ma'am. None whatsoever. I didn't. Um, I did four tours in Iraq. Mm -hmm. I did a tour in Afghanistan. I did that small time in East Africa where I was medically evacuated because of the mass in my brain. Right. Uh, never went to seek any medical health treatment. Was under fire in Iraq on three of my four tours. Um, 122 missiles, mortars, uh, machine gun fire uh, at a helicopter. Um, hmm, never any ID. You said four tours in Iraq, yes, one in Afghanistan, and a short stint. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay. Worked at headquarters of Marine Corps in Quantico. Um, what was your highest rank? Lieutenant Colonel. Okay. So the bottom line is is that um, uh, what I do have, and what I've always told the VA, is I have a mass issue, mm -hmm. and I don't hate to use the term mass because it implies other things, but I have a swollen blood vessel in my right brain right. stem, and uh, I just have to check the time real fast. Yeah. And, and the fact that that is it, that is a situation that I have, and, I, and mm -hmm. people know about it even though I really don't want them to know about right. it, they know about it. Okay. And but the thing is where I have a problem with the VA and I have a problem with their treatment is I kept telling them, Dr. Dr. Allen at Longstool said, Craig, here's the key to you. Unless we do an MRI with contrast, it's not going to show up. They tried an MRI. It didn't show. Mm -hmm. They did the MRI with contrast, which I really don't know what that entails. I they shoot something into me. Right. Uh, it only showed the MRI with contrast. So I was very specific with the VA. You have to do an MRI. You have to do it with contrast or EEGs won't work. Uh, pet, uh, what's the other one called? The C C C CT? Scans. CT scans won't show anything. The, MR, uh, the VA did a CT scan, not the MRI with contrast, and they said, well, you're fine. I said, Dr. Allen, everybody else told me about that. Uh, no, 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 you can't do that. And what kind of discharge you end up with? Honorable. Okay. Yeah, honorable, and, and I'm fully retired. I get I get it all retirement at 60. Okay. And are you service connected at all? What does that mean, ma'am? Uh, like, do you get benefits from the VA? Yes, ma'am. They gave me what's called a five-year letter, and the fun. So I guess like a disability benefit. Oh like no, 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 no. Okay. Uh, everybody in the world tells me that I'm a fool. I get this every day. I get this all the time from mm -hmm. former Marines who have service disabilities and all that kind of stuff. And I, I appreciate you asking that question because I'm going to. Uh, they tell me I'm an idiot. 
because of what the, my medical diagnosis, mm -hmm. they said you are an absolute idiot for not getting a VA benefits. You can draw a big check every month. My belief, Dr. Callaway, is I can work. All right, gotcha. I can cut grass if I have to. Uh, when I'm not having to do stuff like this, I can actually go out and represent people. Mm -hmm. and, and how long you been an attorney? Uh, I've got my well, my bar card. I got I got it in 19. Um, well, graduated from law school in 1988, ma'am, and then I got I passed the bar in 1989. So let's call it 1989 is when they gave me my license. Okay. And what kind of law have you practiced? I, I just, and we're getting in areas where I'm not really comfortable with because we're getting yeah, personal. And if, we, and yeah, if you're yeah, not comfortable with yeah, yeah. you don't have to Yeah, the, the bottom line is I, I used to do real estate law, development, uh -huh. water law, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, when I came back here and after my dad passed and all that, I started finding such grave injustice uh, with what was going on with the uh, public defender's office and them not representing people. Mm -hmm. People coming to me in tears saying we're, I'm, I'm, they're jerking me around the public defender's office not representing me properly. I started taking on cases uh, with indigent individuals who needed um, who needed criminal defense work and found horrific things going on in the public defender's office. So that's so what I'm doing right now. Main focus. Yes, ma'am. I just I guess it makes me sick that things are going on here. And then in this current case, you are you planning to represent yourself? Ma'am, if I could find, I, I've always I've always been an individual who uh, speaks a little fast and uh, speaks with a little intensity, and that and I appreciate your patience and your ability to do, to weather that. Mm -hmm. It's been my way of my whole life, and people say you're too intense or whatever. I saw a guy yesterday um, who was in my I ran a boys club for a year, uh, an optimist boys club in Broderpool. I saw him yesterday, and I thought. This is a guy who I trusted as a kid when he's 10 years old. I bet he's still a good guy. I've been trying to find the attorney to represent me because I want an attorney to represent me. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted that first, uh, I think her name was Bathiba. I wanted her to represent me at the public defender's office because she had a smile on her face. She, she talked about stuff. We said, well, here's what we're going to do. She was all enthusiastic about it. And they came and took her away from me and said, no, you don't get to have her. But I, I talked to Gary yesterday and said, Gary, I'd like you to come down. I want you to look over this stuff. I'd like you to come down here and try to explain to Dr. Callaway, uh, the position I'm taking and so on, and explain the case law and all that kind of stuff, and then we can start working on the case itself, getting there with all the things done for the case. And Gary told me, and I'm happy to say this, to heck with train client privilege on this, uh, Gary said, yeah, I would never have you answer any questions to her. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just, it, that's not the right thing to do. And he said, here's my price, and I gave him the money. He said, this will take care of it from beginning to end of your case, both cases. And he said, I'm going to make a call to the prosecutor's office and let them know that we really just want to call this whole thing off for tomorrow. And I laughed at him. I said, you understand who these two guys are? And who, he said, what two guys? Fogel and Cunningham. Yeah, uh, not my favorite people in the world. Uh, I said, you're going to make a phone call to him and call it off, huh? Mm -hmm. And he said, yeah. I said, all right. I said, you know, good luck with that. Mm -hmm. And so he, so he said, well, uh, call me later. I said, well, I'll come by and drop by your office later. He said, no, just call me. It's no big deal. You don't have to come by. I said, all right. So I get a phone call from him. He said, you need to be in my office in 20 minutes if you can make it. And I said, okay. He said, I'm finishing up. He said, can you be here in 20 minutes? I said, yeah, I'll be there in 20 minutes. So I drive by his office, and he says, uh, well, Craig, he said, you know, uh, there's the hard way and the easy way to do this. And I said, well, Gary, I don't want the easy way. I want the hard way. I want, you know, I'm innocent. I want to fight this thing. We're going to go and do this thing by the numbers. We're going to build our case. Gary said, well, I talked to the prosecutor's office, and Craig, all you have to do is just say you're mentally ill and you're willing to go in for treatment, and it'll all go away. And I said, Gary, I'm not going to say I'm mentally ill. I'm not going to go for involuntary treatment. I'm going to fight this case because I'm innocent. And he said, well, you know, Craig, you know, I said, Gary, I'm innocent. We're going to build this case by the numbers. He said, no. He said, you know, he said, well, you know, I... I if you're not going to follow my directions, I said, Gary, you're not going to tell me to top a plea and declare I'm mentally ill when I can't state that. And I won't state that because I'm not mentally ill. And he hands me my money back. Now, that's a guy who said not to come in here and even talk to you at all. He told me to call it up, and he talks to those guys, and all of a sudden he wants me to cop a plea. And that's the attitude I've seen from every lawyer that I've approached, doctor, in this county. I go there, they have one attitude. And then afterwards, after they talk to some people, they talk to the prosecutor or whatever, they don't want anything to do with the case. And so do you think you have any mental health issues? No, ma'am, I do not. Okay. Here are my faults, ma'am. I am an individual who took an oath with the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. I raised my right hand on multiple occasions. Every time I got promoted, I raised my right hand. 
I swore to protect my country against all enemies, foreign and domestic. I take that oath very seriously. All right. I've watched good people, men and women, die. All right. So I've watched good people sacrifice their lives for the United States in order to protect this country, to take orders and go out and do things. I have taken also another oath as an attorney. And I can't remember that oath, unfortunately, because I only took it once from the Supreme Court. It says I'm supposed to do my best as an attorney to defend my clients. And if I know somebody's innocent, I'm not going to even let them talk about a plea unless they say, no, I don't really, I, I, don't, I, I just tell them, tell them to find another counsel. If you're, they tell me they're innocent, and we go through, and we, I say, you know what, you are innocent. And if they want to say, well, I'm going to cop a plea because I just want to get rid of this, I'm going to say, hey, you know what, I'm going to find you with other competent counsel who can swallow that and do it. Because my job is to fight for you and make sure you do not get convicted if you're innocent. Period. And that, if, I, if I violate that oath, then I need to stop being an attorney. And if I violate the other oath, then I need to stop being a Marine. I can't call myself a Marine any longer. Uh, I cannot, I have a hard time with lawyers who just want to take money and throw people under the bus. That's my fault. I have a hard time with a system, when in here in Marion, Marion County used to be a good system. I have a hard time with a system that doesn't do the things by the rules, by the numbers. And that's where I was went to the the level of going the writ of prohibition against Judge Keel because there were so many anomalies in my dad's case, so much money that was disappeared, weapons, weapons, things that were done so against the law, the law that they were unexplainable. That's why I had to file that. So that's my fault. My fault is also I talk too fast. My fault is I'm very passionate about things. I'm very passionate about people and their dignity. And and some people can't tolerate that. They just simply don't want people do around their attention. Do you always talk that fast, or does it does that ebb and flow? Uh, when I talk about things I care about, mm -hmm. I talk this fast. When I'm having a good time with friends and so on, when I'm out, uh, I'm supposed to go to dinner tonight with a woman who just had her third baby and it's her night out, first night out really, mm -hmm. and so I'm treating her and her husband to dinner because um, it's her night to celebrate, and so that's the reason I keep looking at the clock. Okay. Um, and we have to pick her up. But anyway, if I'm with them, mm -hmm. then no, because I avoid, I avoid something I'm passionate about, because uh, people like to, they like to laugh, they like to have a good time. And I don't like to talk about politics. I don't like to talk about what's going on in the world with, uh, with uh, in Syria or. Well, can like you this. slow down in those circumstances? Oh, sure. Like absolutely, where absolutely. That at that point is it's not something that I'm passionate about, and so it's more like joking and so on. Okay. And when you're out with people like that, I mean, do you talk about like Nasser and those things that no, have been going on? No, ma'am. Okay. Uh, it, for the most part, you know, when you when you when you have a situation with. I have a phrase that I use, Doctor. It's easy to know what the wrong thing to do is. It's hard to know what the right thing to do is. And I've compared this situation in a way, I look back at the people who, in different times of history, mostly in this country, where you have that situation where you see bad things happening around, and what do you do? How do you, how do you responsibly approach it? My way of dealing with this in the past is you go to law enforcement, you report the matters to law enforcement, you let the professionals handle it, right? I mean, that, they're the, that's what they do for a living. You say, here's what I know, please look into this, and if they find that there's no issue, whatever. Uh, I had a good relationship with the FBI in the past on a thing called, called steganography. Are you familiar with that term? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, for purposes of what I did in the Marine Corps, not as I was never a cryptologist, I never did anything in the Marine Corps that dealt with cryptology or intelligence, but I became an individual who could see what in things called steganography. There were things that have gone on at different bases in the United States where steganography was used to report out things on those bases. I was able to go to the FBI in the past and say, here it is, here's actually a language out of North Africa that when you do overlays, when you actually take the images and you basically put them on transparencies and you overlay them, the combination formed letters from North African languages that they had to go and translate to figure out what messages were being translated out of those bases. And those bases are high security bases. So, uh, so I had a good relationship with steganography, what's called white on white. You know, are familiar with that? No. Okay. But, but before, yes, I, didn't, I don't necessarily need details okay, okay, yes, on that. But in terms of your contact with the FBI, is that something that you still have? Like, do you still talk no, to them? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. They, I am, I, no, ma'am. The uh, FBI, I had, I reported out on, this is, let me walk through it if you don't mind. I reported out on an individual who made an admission during a social gathering that he was smuggling out B-2 bomber uh, plans because mm -hmm. he thought it was cool to have them. I reported him immediately to the FBI. My understanding he was arrested. His security clearance was revoked. 
and bad things happened with that contractor in California. I found a white-on-white -white transmission uh, out of a, uh, a foreign country in the Caribbean that had a list of names and the term Ames 100, which was the term after that was being used for Ames 100 is the, um, I'm sorry, it's the biological, uh, gosh darn it, anthrax. It was the anthrax, Ames 100 was the anthrax that was used to mail and that's when the postal workers got sick and died. I found the Ames 100 list, uh, the list of individuals from the media and a couple of Marine Corps, uh, Marine Corps general and a few other military individuals that was on that list in the margin, uh, the printouts on that, turned it over to a special agent uh, in the Indianapolis field office. That was a week after 9-11. And that's when we started having the Ames 100 attacks three weeks later, and those Ames 100 attacks then killed postal workers. Um, that was the second one. The third one dealt with a base, a military base, where special people were held. And the, uh, the and I'm, I am a semi-expert, I will call myself self-declared, but other people would say that on looking at an object and saying, uh, looking at an image and saying, there is stuff here that doesn't make any sense. Let's do, an, let's do a transparency of it. Let's do an overlay and see if it comes out to something that we need to look at. Uh, and I do have an eye for that. Uh, the way my brain's organized, I guess, I see patterns well. And based on that, I was able to turn things over to two agents at the FBI office here in Indianapolis for purposes of, of uh, that transmission, or I'll call it a transmission, that communication that came out of a base, a uh, military base that was a high, highly classified base, and uh, they were able to do work on that. Um, uh, and the fourth one was, I won't call it, the uh, fourth uh, relationship was, and I probably should be careful with this one, it was a anomaly, something I just by accident, a serendipitous situation I tripped over on the web, and it was a literal trip over, that identified the two individuals who were arrested for the peroxide, they called them the peroxide bombers. Uh, they were researching on the web how to get information on the subway system in New York City. They were buying every engineering book they could on the sub the, how the subway system was designed and so on. But they were also uh, buying a book on Q-Tab. Do you know who he is? No. Okay, Q-Tab is the, like the uh, George Washington of the Muslim Brotherhood. Oh, gotcha. Uh, and he worked out of Egypt, kind of a, he was considered an extremist. Everybody who's a terrorist reads q -tab. Mm -hmm. When you find people who are researching, researching books on the subway system and also reading and also buying q -tab books, that's something that I found out and I turned that over to the FBI. Those are the two individuals that came out of Colorado were buying inordinate amounts of peroxide. They arrested them coming over the bridge in New York City and they're arrested for playing the bombing. Do you of help with that? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, you know, and, th and this is where, ma'am, uh, that's when, that's the good old days, I call it, with the FBI, mm -hmm. where you see something that doesn't make any sense, and you say, okay, guys, you're the pros, you went to Quantico, you're the experts, it's in your safe hands, I'm washing my hands of it. Mm -hmm. They take it, things happen, and we smile at one another, and that's it. So have you reported any of this stuff with Nasser to anyone? I, t um, the Saturday... The Saturday after my attack, um, and, and let me tell you about the, the attack just in one sense of this, ma'am. They told me three things. They told me, you're not going to survive the attack, so don't think you're going to be able to talk to anybody. Even if you survive the attack, they're planning on dumping me back in my house and having me being found in my house. They said, number one, you won't survive the attack. Number two, if you survive the attack, uh, nobody's going to believe anything you're going to say because we've inf infiltrated every law enforcement agency that you could ever go to. And the third thing is, if you go to law enforcement on this, we're going to ruin you on the dark web and on the regular web, so nobody will ever want to talk to you again. Now, I don't know what the dark web is. People talk about it. I have no idea how to find the dark web. I don't ever want to go near the dark web. But they, they like talking about the dark web a bunch. And, and I don't know what they said about me on the dark web or on the real web. But they said no one will ever want to get near you again. And so that's the context of how I ended up getting away from it. It's not like I broke out and escaped and anything drama, okay? I basically woke up the next morning with my legs not working, with my body not working properly, and uh, almost punch drunk, if I can tell you, even like I had been hit in the head a bunch of times, went to a court hearing with Judge Michael Keel, uh, told, the, 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 told, the, uh, told the, the Robert Thompson that I was going to the hospital because I was not well, and then went and went to the emergency room to the VA. The VA then saw me, they, they checked me in and released me. They didn't do the MRI with contrast, as I asked. 
I then still felt pat, poor. I still felt unwell a couple of days later. I then went and checked myself in the VA again because into the emergency room, not checked in, but I went to the emergency room again and said, I still feel horrible. I'm concerned about, I was concerned about being home, not being able to take care of myself because I felt so terrible and I wanted them to find out what, what, how much damage I had to my body. I never mentioned that at that time because I wanted the, the FBI to handle all of it. After going to the VA twice, ma'am, to the ER, to the VA twice, I then went to the FBI's field office. It's behind Castleton Square, if you know that, the big, mm -hmm. I call it the bunker. I went to that office behind the, uh, Castleton, the Castleton Square. Uh, on a Saturday, I got my car out there. Um, I didn't have anybody to drive me, so I limped the car out there with me in it. Uh, got through security, and an analyst came down to security and talked to me, and he refused. I had notes I wanted to give him. I had I wanted him to take my phone and uh, and run my phone for purposes of malware or send it to their their techs. I wanted him to um, do a recorded interview with me. I wanted to do a sworn statement, and he spent five minutes with me. I started talking about Nasser, and he said we're done, and he walked away and left. Uh, so he refused to take any information regarding Nasser. Okay. Nobody will take information on Nasser except one group, the Internal Revenue Service. And the Internal Revenue Service, I finally got done with, I got so upset with, and let me go, I'll go to, I can go into NCIS and DCIS in a minute. I can tell you what they are and why they're involved in this. But the reason why I went to the IRS, I never thought about them before, but I remember Capone was taken down by the IRS. He wasn't taken down by the FBI or anybody else. The Internal Revenue Service took him down and got him put in prison. I kept waiting for the FBI. I said, you know, these are good people. The FBI are good people. Eventually, they're going to contact me, and they're going to bring me in for an interview. They're just researching what's going on here. So I tried to call the hotline. I tried to call headquarters up in, 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 uh, in uh, Washington, D.C., I, and I asked for the inspector general to look into why they weren't contacting me because I wanted to get this all written down, and I was afraid something could happen again where I could get grabbed. They never would contact me. I finally went to the Internal Revenue Service, just the opposite. Internal Revenue Service, I go to their law, their enforcement branch, professional man or woman, I tell her, here's what I'm about. She says, stand by, come in the room. She leaves, she grabs a guy, she comes out, and it's by the numbers. And when I was at the U.S. Attorney's Office, there's a certain protocol that's followed, Dr. Calloway. First thing you do is you flip your credentials, and you hold them out so that people can see exactly who you are. Badge, ID, picture, right? Here's who I am. Look at it, mm -hmm. make sure you know who you're talking to. Okay, got that. That's number one. Number two is they go over just like you did. Here's the protocol for what we're going to do in the interview today. All right, here's how long it's going to take. Here's the kind of questions we're going to ask. Make sure you ask, you think about what you're going to answer. And then they go through the questions. Two agents sat down with me an hour and a half. They went through every detail of Nasser. The, the money laundering scheme that I knew about with Chase Bank, I had that, I, I had to verify that through a second source. I had it through two different sources. And the second source was actually the bank manager who confirmed that she was the bank manager for Nasser and that she was fired after the fact, after they found out that they were, there was money laundering going on in Chase. He has a, Nasser had a, still has a front company that is a used car lot. And he also provided used cars with dealer plates to my sister, a half sister, former half sister, all the time. That's part of her, rec her compensation for being a dealer for him. She always had a different car with a dealer plate on it. But, IRS took all the information regarding the Chase Bank, money laundering, his front companies. Uh, I gave him the basic outline from what I knew from my contact about how he did the organized crime, escort services, uh, vigorous, which is loan sharking, um, extortion. Um, uh, uh, what's the word I want to use here? Blackmail. That's the biggest one they're, they're, they're focusing on right now according to my contacts. They tried to blackmail me. That's what they were telling me was that if I didn't, that's, they told me if I cooperated with them, Dr. Calloway, that everything would go easy with me. All I had to do was be a source for them in the future. They want attorneys to throw cases on demand. They want attorneys to provide information on clients. They want attorneys to provide information on, on attorneys who they think are dirty, that, that they can use sexual, uh, sexual peculiarities. I don't know what the term to say is, but mm -hmm. if, if uh, whether they're having affairs, where they know whether they've thrown cases, they want to get information on attorneys, they want to get information on judges, they want to get information on politicians, accountants, anything they can do. They said we can either you can either cooperate with us, and what's the word they used? It was a group, so they used different words at different times. But I always try to figure out who was actually doing the most patterns on different word choices. There's a certain word 
that they used to do it. I had, it was almost like a, uh, not the safe word, but it was a word that would indicate if I would say the word, that would indicate to me, to them, that I was going to cap capitulate was one of the words they used, capitulate. If I would capitulate and I would use a certain word, then that would mean that I had basically, I, they owned me at that point. So either I fought and I was going to be dead, or I would surrender based by saying the word. As soon as I said the word, that told them that, that from that point on, they owned me. And I was there. And I would be out practicing law, but they would come in and, and tell me exactly how it was going to be in the future. And, and when I came out of there, I mean, I can't tell you how many hours it was. I, it felt internally in my brain like it was days because the way they used, it, the way they used a certain, a very rigorous process, a very process to ramp me up, ramp me down, ramp me up, ramp me down, ramp me up, ramp me down. And I've never been a part of an interrogation process for what we call it, uh, interrogation, uh, we use the term, it's a military term, I'm sorry, I, ha I always have it, translator interrogators. Translator interrogators use a certain process for breaking down a captive. I'm not part of that process. You know, CIA uses it, Translator interrogators use it. I'm not a part of that process. But they use a certain process to make a person give them no hope. It appeared to me these people were very professional at doing this because they had a certain process where they would ratchet me up and ratchet me down. And, I kept, and they kept trying to get me to think it's all going to end. It's all over. I, it, we're done. And then all of a sudden they'd pause for a minute and say, ah, here we go again. And they'd start ratcheting me up through a certain sequence of events mm -hmm. to let me know it's beginning. And they'd ratchet me down after they did their... So, their like, are they torturing you or what do you mean? Or just mental? Well, um... I didn't want to go in detail on this. The there was physical, and then there was there was physical, and then there was physical, well, mental. What do you mean by mental? Well, I mean physical is like laying hands on you or forcing you to like be in certain physical positions, versus mental is like just trying to mess with you psychologically. May, well, I consider the ratcheting up and ratcheting down a psychological okay. situation. May I demonstrate? Uh, sure. Okay, thank you. And what uh, I'm forgetting about the record here. And this is what I already told the state police, mm -hmm. okay? The, uh, cause I met with the state police for an hour and a half also, and they, okay. they took the information and flipped it out into the wind, published it out, uh, and I have evidence of that. They actually, I actually have a copy of my recording that I got through third party. Um, okay, so there can be face this way. I was in a harness system. I never have heard anything like this. I was in a harness system, so I was always on my feet. I don't know how many cables were on holding me up, but the, the key cable that they would use for ratcheting me up and ratcheting me down, mm -hmm. and I'd use it as a descriptive term, they actually had a ratchet system that was attached to the back part of the harness that kept me suspended, that kept me up on my feet, and it actually had a ratchet. I mean, and, and I didn't see the ratchet, but I could feel it. I could feel right. the tension in the line, mm -hmm. and it made a clicking sound. And the clicking sound was so distinct, I had earphones on, which when they talked to me, they talked to me through the earphones. And so I never got to hear... They, Sometimes they would use their natural, natural voice, voices, but they were using some kind of audio file where they would use like a synthesizer to put certain words in. And, and to indicate that, they were, that the whole thing was over with, they would start releasing the tension on the, on the wire behind me. And they'd try to say, okay, we're all done, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then it'd be like a couple of seconds or whatever, and then all of a sudden you feel the tension ratcheting back up. And they tighten this thing back up again, mm -hmm. and they go through a whole other sequence. Every sequence on questioning would last so many minutes, and that would, every sequence would go to a certain type of theme for questions. Things about Iraq, things about Afghanistan, things about military officers, things about the Nasser group, the different things I knew about him and his uh, organization, uh, I'm trying to think of all the different subjects. Things I worked on, specific things I worked on that I had completely forgotten about. Uh, when I was a, I'll call myself kind of an, uh, what's called Center for Lessons Learned, as like an investigator. Mm -hmm. I would uh, go and do interviews in Iraq on things that went wrong and things that went right and why. And then report it back to the rear and they'd do reports up to, for, out into the Marine Corps. Um, they had a sleep, what I call a sleeve system, ma'am. I mean, that's the only I can describe it. And again, I don't know anything about this right. stuff. They were pneumatic sleeves, one on each arm, the sleeve, like think like of blood pressure cuff only they covered from the wrist all the way up to the shoulder. They could inflate those in order to regulate, um, in order to regulate blood or not blood pressure, blood flow in the arms, in the torso, underneath the arms, one wrapped around the waist, around the, the abdomen, and one on each leg. 
And so when they were going through a series of questions, at times, it was almost like a pneumatic pump. It wasn't like somebody was pumping it up. It's almost like I couldn't hear any noise to it. But all of a sudden, they, one would start deflating and another one would inflate. And then, or all would inflate. And, and so my body was constantly dealing with the fact I wasn't getting blood flow to my left leg or I wasn't getting blood flow to my left arm or I was starting to get pain in my chest because my left arm was so tightly constricted that I couldn't get blood flow to, to pump through my arm. So I get my shoulder hurting, my jaw would start hurting, my chest would start hurting. And so I guess it was like a way to simulate somebody having a heart attack, I guess, without actually, uh, without actually leaving marks because there were no marks on my, on my body. And the only thing that happened after that, ma'am, was uh, I, and I took pictures on this and I have the actual chip, but my chip now has failed. I actually have pictures, if I can recover the pictures, off of my chip. That's one of those little SIM disks, if you will, scan mm -hmm. disks or whatever they're called. My legs are swollen to such an extent, they're, they're, they're three times the size of my legs right now. They are highly red with white splotches throughout them. And I actually took a picture with a little camera that has scan disk in it and took pictures of both my legs. Both my legs are heavily large and my ankles are so thick that it was hard for me to walk. That's one thing that was very hard for me to do, to walk, is my legs and my ankles and my feet were swollen so bad I couldn't get my shoes on hardly. And, it's, and it's, I, I didn't know what was going on. It's like fluid had just built up in my legs and, and they weren't working properly. Um, I do have that picture. I just got to find somebody that's a tech that can recover those pictures off of that scan disk. Um, and, 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 oh, and the last thing was, and I, I hope I'm not, earphones, goggles, mm -hmm. and then the thing on top, if, you know, the swimmer caps, I don't know if they still warm or not, they usually just shave their heads now, but, you know, the swimmer caps that are really tight? Mm -hmm. Okay, imagine one of those, and, but yet it inflates. It was a cap that came up over my head, but it could be inflated to be, to go from tight to almost rigidly hard based on how much pressure they pumped into it. Um, and then, then I, like I said, the, this wand effect where it wasn't square, it wasn't a circle, it wasn't something small, like a, like a head of something, when it would come over, it would actually hit my body, I could feel a elongated area that would actually start cramping. Mm -hmm. And I thought they were using ultrasound, uh, but again, it left no marks, but it caused my bowel to cramp heavily. It caused my, I know my, my liver's here. I know my pancreas is here. Uh, these two areas would start hurting very he heavily. When they started hitting the area around my pancreas, I started having really, um, I started feeling very bad in my brain, if you will. That's one thing I can say. It's like very toxic in my brain. That's one way I can describe it. Uh, kidneys would, uh, when they hit me in certain areas, I'd have to urinate very badly, and they'd tell me just to hold it. You're going to have to heal it or wet yourself. Uh, they didn't use that term. I'm not going to mm -hmm. use the vulgar terms they used. Uh, but they wanted me to defecate myself and to urinate myself in order to break down my, how they term it. They said, that, you, know, uh, you know, we're going to have you, so when you do that, you're never, you're, I can't remember how they described it, but they wanted me, they, they saw it as soon as I did that, I had, I had lost a round to them. I had lost a certain level to them as soon as I would, and so I would hold as, as hard and long as I possibly could uh, until I might, my, you know, until they hit another with another wand, and all of a sudden my bladder would just, it wouldn't work. My bladder actually just would just fail, and I would actually, I would just, what, what's the word they use? They use the word uh, evacuate, complete mm -hmm. evacuation. In some way, almost like a technical term, complete, he has, he has complete evacuation. And I would, and I could feel the hot urine going down my legs. Uh, I, I wore at the time uh, long underwear. I have it. It's a very thin, long underwear because my, my legs had gotten cold with sweat in the past, uh, and I would wear those, and they just would soak it up, and so I, I didn't be sitting in urine for the rest of the time period, uh, for the rest of the area, and then I wasn't given anything to food, eat, or drink, so it wasn't like I was really building that back up. But what was interesting was after I would completely evacuate out and be sitting in urine, by toning me again, I would produce more urine over the course of time. And they could then I had to go again to a part where I had to hold it, and they would try to continue to work it, so I'd have to urinate myself again. It's starting to be so descriptive. And actually, Thanks, actually, you have a great. Uh, this is a great situation because this is the first time I've actually talked about that with people that I haven't. Uh, they haven't gotten really angry, so uh, I appreciate this. this. Is actually nice. Good, good. Now, and so when is your when's your next court date? Well, that's, that's a strange thing, doctor, um, and that's one thing I got to check with them on, but they okay. were at lunch. My second session, doctor, is supposed to be with Dr. Parker. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Dr. Parker is gone for the weekend, 
he is gone, and he is. Um, he told me he's going to get a late flight in, so he couldn't do an early session. So on the 19th at one o'clock, I'm supposed to meet him at his office. Gotcha. At the same time, I just can't make this stuff up. At the same time that I'm scheduled with Dr. Parker, they scheduled another court hearing with me. So I, so it, I, I have to state the obvious here. Mm -hmm. So what they're saying is, if you don't come to the court hearing when you're scheduled with Dr. Parker, we're going to throw a warrant out for your arrest. And if you don't attend the hearing with, or you don't attend the session with Dr. Parker, we're going to throw a warrant out for your arrest. So she was nice enough to look at me and kind of smile. And she goes, well, maybe you check with us tomorrow. And this is when I was here yesterday confirming this was all going to happen. Right. She said, maybe you check with us tomorrow. We can figure out what's going on here. And I said, well, you know, that'd be really nice because you, you've got me in a situation. No, no matter what I do, mm -hmm. you're going to put a warrant out for my arrest. Okay, so your court date is supposed to be Monday, but... No, no, no. Well, that's what they have right now. Right. I think it's a mistake. The real court date that he set in, in mm -hmm. court was April 9th, ma'am. April 9th. Okay. Yeah, that's the one he set in court. Yeah. April 9th will give you chances to do all your stuff. Mm -hmm. Yep. Are there any other documents you want me to have except for, um, in addition to the Estelle case and then the two years that you gave me? Uh, uh, no, ma'am. You know, if, if you wanted to actually look, you, part of this, ma'am, is whether I can actually participate in, in my own defense. Right. And, and, let, let's, and you asked that question. I want to answer that question for you. We didn't go into that. Here's, my, here's the way I, I treat a, a, a case to go in and do my mm -hmm. work. First of all, you've got to listen to the 911 call, okay? And you've got to get the 911 tape and you've got to leave the, get, and get a transcript of it. That's number one. Number two, you've got to be able to look at the scene. And I do this for all my cases. Okay. You've got to look at the scene, and you've got to take photographs, and you've got to be able to study that scene. All right? Number three is you've got to be able to talk to your witnesses. And you've got to be able to get them a deposition under oath, all right, to say what occurred. All right? And then you've got to go and prepare your motions. You've got to prepare and use a whole series of motions you prepare, and you prepare your, uh, your discovery, and you do your different things, and you have a certain protocol, I call it a protocol checklist you go through to do a case to make sure you do a case properly and prep for trial. That is how I handle it. That's what I wanted to do with the public defender's office because here's the thing. They have prohibited me from ever going back into the Napoli's restaurant. The Napoli's restaurant had no, they, they filed no complaint on me that day, ma'am. And we never went into that, that, that session that day. All right. Now, what happened on the 21st was, and, and, and this is very telling, I had been to the press, to the Star News, the day before to talk about electronic EVs traveling in this town and I wanted to provide documents to them and provide how it was being done and by the, provide the systems that were being used for electronic eavesdropping. I went and uh, went the day before. The day before, uh, they said, I met with our assistant to the, one of the reporters. She came down. She said, I'm his assistant. Let me take all your information down and what you want to tell us. She took it all down. I was inside the inside the, the Star, ma'am, at on uh, Meridian Street. There, where the where it used to be Nordstrom's. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm inside there. I'm joking around with the security guards and everything else. She takes all my stuff. I live in the old North Side, and so the next morning I get up. I look outside. And I see this guy in a white car that fits what the unmarked police cars have over on the. Uh, it's called the. I don't know what to say. IMPD dispatch area right there off of Meridian, right there in South Meridian, uh, right next to the train tracks there. there. All their unmarked police cars are parked there with their marked police cars, and one of their unmarked police cars was in front of my home. It had a white male, about, eh, let's call him 30, 35 years old, dark hair, not in uniform, in plain clothes, no jacket, a shirt, uh, and trousers. I look into the trousers, I'm assuming he had trousers on. Uh, and he has a gigantic, well, not gigantic, a large black cell phone scanner, because I know what they look like. They look like a really big walkie-talkie mm -hmm. with a short black antenna on them, sitting in the driver's seat in front of my home. And I thought, no, that's interesting. And so I said, you know what, I'm not going to walk out the front of my house today. So I went, went out the back door of my house. I go down to 14th Street, which is an alleyway. I come up around my neighbor's, my neighbor's, um, home and I go around the corner and I take my little camera which I had taken pictures of my legs and I take pictures of the car. I then go down to um, I then go down to the star to say, hey, do you want to do the interview? An off duty police officer meets me outside the star and says, You don't get to do this short story with the star. And I said, Well I'll tell you what, officer, have me have a journalist tell me that and I'm fine. But you're not a journalist and I really don't know how your, what your relationship is here. So 
have a journalist tell me, and I'm fine. I, you know, I'm, I'm okay with a journalist not wanting the story. He said, no, if you don't leave right now, I'm going to have you arrested for trespassing. I said, you know what? I'm gone. I leave the front of the Star News, and I go down 30 South Marina Street. As you know, 30 South Marina Street is where the Supreme Court has their offices. They have city security, and they have Napoli's Restaurant and Ocean Air. I was a longtime uh, user of Ocean Air as far as their services. Never really been in Napoli's before. I go up to the Continuing Legal Education Commission that's there, and I say, hey, everybody, I need to change my address from my post office box, which I'm no longer going to keep, to my home address. And they told me, you're in the wrong place. You need to go to the State House and do it with a role of attorneys. Thank you very much for telling me that. I leave there. I drop by city securities on the way down and said, hey, would you have Spencer Michelo, who's my best friend's son, come down and meet me downstairs in the lobby? And they said, fine. And they said, it'll be you know, 10 or 15 minutes. I said, fine. I said, I'll be downstairs waiting for him. Tell him it's Craig Kenworthy. He's, he knows me well. I'm basically his godfather for all practical purposes. I've known him since he's a baby. I said, have him come downstairs and meet me downstairs. I sit downstairs. I'm joking with the security guard. He tells me it's his first day on the job. He's a little bit nervous. I said, hey, listen, you're doing a great job. You know, the place is secure. You're safe. I'm sitting in front of his desk. And he looks at me after a little bit. And he said, are you sure this guy's coming down? I said, yeah. He said, let me call up there. And or somebody, uh, somebody called him and said, some other name like Nathan won't be down today. And he said, well, Nathan's not coming down today, uh, Mr. Kenworthy. Uh, you know, uh, what do you want to do? And I, and I said, well, Nathan ain't the guy I'm looking for. I'm looking for Spencer Michelow. He said, well, let me call back up there. So he calls back up to, to City Securities, and he says, is Spencer Michelow going to come down and meet this guy? And she said, yeah, it'll be about 15 minutes. He said, okay, he'll be down in 15 minutes. Then after a little bit longer, he says, you know what? Um, do you mind waiting someplace else? And I said, well, you know what? I said, is it okay with me, me to, to stay in the Napoli, or go over here to the Napoli's restaurant? Because if you've if you ever been in Napoli's restaurant, it's a gigantic glass wall, right? Now, it has a gigantic glass wall where you can look, where you can look at the lobby at 30 South Marine Street. And they're connected. I go to Napoli's restaurant. I'm talking to the hostess. Um, she gives me the menu. We're talking about takeout and how to get different things from them. I order a glass of iced tea. I can't read the menu because I don't have my glasses on. I can't read without my glasses. She says, here, use my glasses, and I've got the big women's glasses on, you know, they're pink and all styly, and I'm laughing at myself for wearing women's glasses. She thought it was pretty funny also. And we're going over her dessert menu and all that kind of stuff, and I'm waiting, I'm waiting. And then to make a long story short, and I was like, get you out of here. The uh, police show up. They come into Napoli's restaurant. They, uh, they ask for my ID. I tell them, I said, I would like uh, to have a supervisor here present based on all the weird stuff that's been going on with all the stuff. I'd like to have a supervisor here. They said, supervisor's on the way. Uh, we want your ID. And I said, I want a supervisor here. And I want a supervisor looking over everything that happens. I'm happy, you know, happy to do what you want, but I want to have a supervisor here. And they said, no, give us your ID. And I said, no, I'd like to have a supervisor here. And on that, no, I want a supervisor here. My head is into the counter. My head is into the floor. Uh, they then both stepped back from me, and the are, these are big weightlifter guys, right? These aren't small guys. I'm 100. And, at that point, I'd lost so much weight from everything that happened to me. I was down to about 125 pounds. I'm about 126, 127 now, so I guess the same weight I have right now. I'm in a suit like this. I'm on the floor. My head's bleeding all over the place, and they step back, and I roll over on my back, and I look, reach. I'm, a, I'm not going to demonstrate, but I'm on my back on the floor like this. And I say, "Why are you doing this to me?" And ma'am. Dr. Calloway, they step back, they pull their, they step back again in their step, they pull their stun guns out, they hit me with two darts. I'm getting electrified. And I'm thinking, well, this is, this is, this is not good. And so I'm getting, and then while I'm doing that, my legs are up in this position right here, like so my foot's flat, and my legs are bent, and so I'm doing the, this thing. He then comes up, and he takes a stick, and I've never seen one of these before. It's a stick that's electrified, and it has some kind of battery system, like a capacitor inside of it. He takes that stick, and he drives it into my calf. Now, I feel my heart zero out. I actually feel a heaviness in this chest area, and I feel myself actually go numb from my top of my head to my toes, and I'm zero out. And then he reaches back, as I'm watching this, and I, and I can't believe this is happening. I think I'm going to die here in Netflix restaurant after I'm surviving four tours in Iraq and a tour in Afghanistan, Everything by trying to kill me every day, I'm going to die in my own backyard. That's one that's in my head. I'm going to die here today from police officers in my own home city. And then he reaches back after he puts that one in my leg. Ma'am, he reaches back and grabs another one from his partner, and he jabs that one in my leg. 
And I just go and I roll over my face. They then take my hands, ma'am, they bring them behind my back, they handcuff me, and then he, I had longer hair then. My hair was longer because I couldn't get afford the haircuts. So it's not like, right, mm -hmm. short as this. He picks me up by the back of my head, this is McWhorter, picks me up by the back of the head and slams my right temple into the, into the floor. So now I've got, I got, a, I got a blood coming from here, blood coming from here, and blood coming from here. I've got both temples with impacts and my forehead with impacts. Four stun gunnings basically, three impacts on my brain, all within a period of four or five minutes. Massive attack. They then arrest me for resisting arrest because I wanted a supervisor there. They arrest me for trespassing the Napoli's restaurant, ma'am, when I was talking to them the entire time. Nobody from Napoli's restaurant called in to complain on me. That's on the record. No one complained I was in Napoli's restaurant illegally. I'd already paid for the iced tea. When I, when I was the last iced tea, I offered to pay for it again, and the sous chef said, no, you don't have to pay for it. You've already paid for it. We're going to do free refills here. So I was legally in the Napoli's restaurant. Not causing any problems, waiting for Spencer Mitchell to come down so I could go for my will with him to make sure he wanted, if he wanted my house, he could have my house. Because he and his mom, my, he and his mom and I had discussions, and I wanted to leave it to her. She, or no, I wanted to leave it to him directly. She said, no, leave it to me, and then I'll give it to him. And I thought, okay, I just need to figure out if he wants it. And so I wanted to make that clear so I get my will done and finalized. And that's what happens. All because I decided to have an iced tea in Napoli's restaurant. And it was building security, not the guy who was talking to me, you know, the guy I told you about it was his mm -hmm. first day and he was nervous. He didn't call in the complaint. It was somebody who I never met that day who called up from the Ocean Air. He actually went into the Ocean Air restaurant, into the coat room of the Ocean Air restaurant, because at the 911 call that I got the file on, the number that was called from to 911 is a whisper. It's like, we have a trespasser in that place restaurant causing trouble. And so I had to, I, it said Ocean Air, uh, the number corresponded to Ocean Air. Uh, I actually called the number, and Ocean Air answered. There's a phone in the cloakroom. This guy walks in, because I asked people, I said, do you have somebody called 911 this day? And he said, no, we don't anything about it. There's a phone on their desk for reservations, and there's a phone in the cloakroom, cloakroom, the coat room right around the mm -hmm. corner. This guy, this, this individual, I'll be nice, this individual who is security, who I never saw that day from, from Securitas, walks into Ocean Air and uses their phone, even though they have two phones this, right there available at their security station, goes into Ocean Air, calls from the Ocean Air inside coat, coat room phone, whispers in that, that there's a troublemaker in, in that police restaurant, and calls a 911 response on me when I have no idea what's going on. No one had ever told me that I had any issue of being having to not be in 30 South Marine Street, let alone being in Napoli's restaurant during business hours, drinking an iced tea that I'd already paid for. Okay. So and so it sounds like if you, when you go to court on these cases, how are you going to handle them? How am I going to handle them? Yeah. I, I, I would never discuss that with anybody. I don't, I mean, well, no, no, no. I mean, like, have you thought about whether you would go to trial, whether you want to do a plea bargain? Ma'am, there will never be a plea bargain ever. Gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. And I've already told that, to the, I've already told that across the board. I, yeah, if, if, you know what, here's, here's the thing, ma'am, on this. And I, and I normally wouldn't answer that question, but I'm always... Well, I'm not asking for specifics about how you're going well, to defend Well, I, I, would, I, would I would never tell somebody to answer that question, okay? Right. But the only thing I'm saying is this. Um, if a person comes to me, if a defendant would come to me, my client, if a client came to me and said, listen, here's the circumstances, and I said, you know what? All right. We need to figure out how to... We need to figure out how to make sure we do a plea bargain in this. And I'm not a plea bargain kind of guy, but if we, I, I would like to hand them off to somebody who would do a plea bargain. I don't believe in handling cases where a plea bargain is necessary. If someone wants to do a plea bargain because things are dicey with their situation, they need to go to somebody who handles plea bargains and wants to work that situation. If I'm representing somebody, they're innocent, and I'm fighting with everything I have in my arsenal that's legal and ethical to make sure that they're acquitted and, and they can file a lawsuit for false arrest, and for whatever, because that's what I believe in. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Um, any other documents that you nope, no, have yet seen? Yeah. Yeah, okay. No, I don't have. I have out my in my car, ma'am. I don't have it with me. I would like you to have the writ of prohibition that I was uh, doing uh, in that case, because one of your questions you have here is whether I'm competent to do legal work. Now, now the thing is, this is not any this is not any great document here. This response, it's a sworn statement, but you know, I can actually prepare documents right. when well, my computer the, works. And the question isn't whether you're competent to do legal work. I mean, the question is, is if actually. you're able to, if you understand what's going on in court, and yes, if you're able to assist, if you have an attorney, yes, you're able to represent yourself. Yes, ma'am. 
Um, well, so. and, well, and, I, and, I, and the thing is, I, and I'm, I'm going to give you my opinion where I think it's, it's proper, okay, mm -hmm. Dr. Calloway. I, I want to disagree with you on that. The, the, if a person, a person can be, a person can be a non-lawyer and still represent themselves. Correct. Okay. They don't have to have legal training. Very all, true. all they have to do is have be able to assert their defense. So if you're able to legal represent yourself, it means that you can understand the crime against you. It means you can understand the uh, the penalties and so on, and and have the and you know where I see these situations. So that's the two prongs. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times in, the, in court marshals, we'll have somebody who wants to represent themselves, and we'll have an advisor, a, a military officer who's an SGA, who's an advisor who can sit back right. there and answer technical questions for that person who wants to go pro se. So, uh, so, so I just want to distinguish that. We can have a non-lawyer who wants to say, I'm going to do a pro se. Yep, that's correct. It, it, it does happen. So I just want to make sure we're clear on that. Uh, but yeah, uh, I, am a, I am one who likes to go through a protocol. And the real challenge I have had in the past is that keeping computer systems, I've had files, ma'am, where I have prepared a file uh, on my computers. And I get it all done. I save it. And I go right then to uh, transfer it onto the thumb drive, mm -hmm. to take it to print it, and it's gone. I've had to do handwritten documents here because I can't keep a file to save on my computer systems. Now, I just brought a brand new standalone system for my computer for Microsoft. I just paid $150 for it. It doesn't have to connect into the web at all. And hopefully, but I just used a contaminated thumb drive, I think, today to print this off. So, um, so we'll see how long this lasts. But the bottom line is, is that I'm trying to go to extraordinary matters. I don't use the web any longer. Mm -hmm. I don't sign emails. People that say, what's your email address? Don't have one. Don't use one. Uh, I refuse to get on the web any longer because I can't protect my computers against it. Gotcha. And so, um, that, you know, as long as I got a computer that's operational, I had to buy mm -hmm. a separate keyboard. As long as I have a computer that's operational, I can produce documents. Okay. okay. I, 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 I uh, sorry. Oh, no, it's okay. And I don't need the, the documents that you were talking about. Okay. I mean, because those are pertaining to that case. I mean, I certainly have the, this one you prepared. I know you gave me the Estelle case, and yes, then you give me what the state gave. So that's that's plenty. Yes, and you have already had you have the order, ma'am. You have the order. Yes. May, may I ask you a question? And, and I don't mean to. Uh, I want to I want to shift gears on this. I was not pleased when I saw my Social Security number and my date of birth on that document. Mm -hmm. I don't believe through HIPAA and everything else they have the right without my permission and Privacy Act. Yeah, I have date of birth. They don't give me Social Security numbers. But it, it's on the it's on the actual order, ma'am. They actually publish it on the order. Usually they will um, block it out when they send. But they didn't. Oh, no, you're right. It's there. They didn't. Yeah. Okay, so, okay, I just want to make sure you haven't utilized the Social Security number in any way. No, no, I actually didn't even know it was on there. Okay, I would try. So the only information I look for is date of birth. Okay. So I have sense about, some sense about how old you are, okay. what your charges are. Okay, and then well, I trust then. I'm going to trust on you on your honor, okay, because I, I like your demeanor, all right? Uh, not that that means anything. Uh, but you're not going to do anything with the Social Security number. That's correct. Okay. It, would, there, would you be com comfortable enough right now just to redact it right now? Oh, yeah, it's absolutely. In your records? Because, uh, yeah, I, a lot of times they will normally do that, but I have no problem. I'll mark that out right now. Yeah, because it's in your records, it's in your practice yeah. and all that kind of stuff, and I really don't feel comfortable with my Social Security number being out there. Yeah, no, I can understand that. I've already had identity theft, and um, yeah. I can no longer... Let make sure it's not on... No, it's not on anything else, ma'am. Okay. Yep, yep, I redacted that. Okay. So no issue there. Well, Mr. Kenway, I appreciate you talking with me. So I will um, write up my report, send it in, try and have it in there before you go back on. You said the 9th? Yes, ma'am. April okay. 9th. All right. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Appreciate, appreciate it. Appreciate it. All right. Good luck with everything. Thank you. So we are ending. So yes, oh, yeah, oh, yes, go yes. ahead and yeah, maybe go ahead. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Um, it it's still going. And 2.45. 2.45 on the 16th. And thanks for reminding me about that. And hopefully I will do this correctly. Uh, let's do a stop. And I think I do this right here.